Okay, well, I'm joined by Luca Johnson, who runs the channel Amiable Arguments. How are you? I'm really, really well, thank you. Yes, yes. I've been uh, looking forward to this and I love the Crusades, so I'm really happy to be getting into all of this. And we're just going to talk about the First Crusade and uh, maybe go on, maybe talk about the Third Crusade or maybe another time talk about the Third Crusade. But it seems like a good place to start with the First Crusade, uh, the Great Crusade. Um, so I thought maybe yes. I could put it in um, some sort of historical perspective, just real quick, just five minutes on that. And then we'll start talking about the Council of Claremont and then all the events and things like that. So one of the first things I wanted to say was that sometimes... Uh, <laughs> revisionists will try and make the argument that um, it was just sort of a crazy Christian, Western, European, sort of crazy aggression against the Islamic world for no real reason other than just bloodlust. Um, but of course, the real reality is that uh, the, the Muslim world had been encroaching on what had been Christian lands since the, the days of Muhammad himself. Um, you know, the, the Seljuk Turks have come crashing down out of Central Asia, somewhere north of Iran, taken over lots of uh, already Muslim uh, kingdoms. The Seljuk Turks originally weren't Muslim, they converted to the Arab religion. <laughs> and then um, and North Africa under the Fatimids is already, of course, uh, its own sort of sultanate. Um, and, but in 1009, under the Fatimid Sultan al-Hakim, uh, they actually burnt down or they destroyed the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. It was rebuilt in about 1048. But so there was a lot of aggression from their side before, before the great the, the first crusade. Y yes, yes, entirely. And the thing as well that I really feel has to be cannot be understated is the fact that since the rise of Muhammad and the way that the, the Muslims had been uh, moving, expanding out of the Arab Peninsula and across northern Africa, and obviously as far into Spain and France and southern Italy, a lot of the lands such as Egypt and Syria and Palestine, that they, they were ruled over by Muslim minority aristocracies, but the general populations were still quite actually heavily Christian. So there was a lot of churches and Christians over there for the Crusaders to feel that they needed to go and save and liberate. It wasn't just entirely now Muslim nations made up entirely of Muslims. There was a lot of uh, religious diversity over there. And, and it suited the Muslims for it to be this way because the jizya and they could get taxes from, from the Christians and people of the book, as it were. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's interesting you mentioned Spain there, or Al Andalus, the, the, the Spanish theatre of operations, if you like. So <laughs> they'd already been fighting there for quite a while. Um, so I just wanted to mention then a quick word about Byzantium, because of course it's all bound up in the Byzantine Empire. Um, mm. In the early 11th century, Basil II, uh, the Bulgar slayer, had been sort of fantastically successful, sort of too successful in a way sort of the old Alexander story, far too successful for anyone after him to hold on to everything. Uh, you know, that mm. story is an old story. You know, I think sometimes I think of Henry II and the Plantagenet Empire. It was probably not going to last long after him. It was sort of, it was too successful in a way. I think you could say that about Basil II. So after Basil II dies, there was all sorts of uh, Byzantine rulers. But we end up with Alexios, don't we? Alexios I. Uh, later, much later in the century. Um, yes. And by that point, really, all the Byzantine holdings, if you like, their empire in Anatolia, mm. modern Turkey, had been taken by the, the Seljuk, the Seljuk Turks. Um, yes. Yeah, if you want to say a word or two about that. Well, it's... Um... It's very interesting, actually, when you not not to skip ahead, but it's really interesting to see how the first crusade is in response to the things that you've just said is actually a real joint effort between the Latin Franks of the Western of Western Europe and the Byzantine Empire together. Uh, and obviously, and just seeing the longevity over time of how that actual joint relationship breaks time breaks down over time along with the crusades themselves 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, so by, well, um, Alexios comes in in about 1081 and the crusade kicks off in, well, 1095, 1096, depends how you want to measure it exactly. Um, so he has a fairly good innings, Alexios, as emperor of Byzantium, considering so many have very short reigns because they keep getting usurped and replaced and all that sort of thing. But the real heartlands, I mean, it was the Seljuk Turks, I must say, it, it was themselves breaking up and had partitioned themselves. So the part of the Seljuk Empire that was in that's in Anatolia was the, the Sultanate of Rum, they called it. And mm. um, there was one particularly powerful Seljuk Turk ruler who had died and his four sons uh, were fighting over uh, parts of the empire. So the Seljuk Empire itself was broken up, broken up into bits. So it, it was actually not a terrible point for the, the West, so to speak, to try and fight back. But yeah, the Byzantines, by that point, by the late 11th century, they, they had uh, sort of the Venetians and the Normans were fighting for them, were sort of their uh, sort of not very trustworthy allies. <laughs> and there was a, quite a strained relationship between the Byzantines and, and uh, well, the Franks, they get collectively called, but, you know, yes. knights from all over Germany and France. Yes, yes, absolutely. And it's also obviously the fact that the, the First Crusade is a, a crusade led by the nobility. It, it's not until quite a bit later that you start actually getting the kings themselves going on the crusade. So you've got the Byzantine emperors, emperor calling for it and uh, begging the Pope for assistance, but, but the kings themselves are actually a bit above it at this point in Western Europe. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you, you say that, of course, um, just before the, the the sort of main portion of the First Crusade, there was, a, you're right to say the kings were above it, and it was more sort of the princes of Europe in the First Crusade. But even before that, there's sort of the famous People's Crusade led by Peter the Hermit. <laughs> i just say a quick yes. word about that. Well, well actually, before Please. we get onto that, let's mention the Pope in Rome, Urban II. And, um, well, just before that even, just to mention the, the Great Schism, the Great East-West Schism in what mm. 1056, roughly. Uh, it's easy to put one year on it, but it's a bit of a longer process than that. But anyway, the 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 Church of Rome and the Church of Constantinople, the churches of the East, the Orthodox and the Catholic churches had sort of had a had a great schism earlier in the century. Nonetheless, Pope Urban II, apparently extremely charismatic uh, preacher type Pope, um, had promised. Uh, Alexios, who had asked for help many times, he finally promised to actually do that. And so he went on, uh, well, his story is quite complicated itself. He had to defeat an anti-pope before he was sort of full pope. But in the end, he goes into France, southern France, first of all, but then all over France, uh, with the exception of sort of Normandy and particular parts of northern France. And in 1095, famously held the Council of Clermont. That's one of the sort of famous things, one of the obvious jump off points or one of the obvious beginnings to start with, where most histories, yes. or nearly all histories will mention it. And at the Council of Claremont, it went on for many days and so it talks about all sorts of ecclesiastical issues. And a few days into it, he says he's got a particularly important speech to make and he goes outside so more people can hear him. And there's a big long speech, you can find the text. Uh, we we're not sure if it's the perfectly correct text, as it as all the accounts are written long after. But uh, sorry, well, we like have about we have about sorry we have about four accounts, don't mm. we? And although mm. they have, uh, um, I think oh gosh, what's his name? Uh, uh, Fulcher of Chartres is one of them, I believe. And although they have different versions of the words themselves we're able to gather from their words the general outline and thesis of what the Pope was claiming for and what the objective of the crusade itself was. Yeah, yeah, and he says, he basically says, look, <laughs> Jerusalem has been taken by um, some, uh, it has been polluted by some Persian type people, <laughs> the Seljuk Turks, yes. Muslims, um, and it, it's on us, God wants us to take it back. And all historians sort of agree that he expected maybe a few thousand knights at best to, to take up the cross, so to speak. Um, mm. But of course, the response was gigantic. You know, no, apparently no one could have dreamt that so many people would. Well, what he says is that if you do go on crusade, you'll you'll um, 
be forgiven for all your earthly, worldly sins. And, and in the 11th century, it seems, apparently, that was unbelievably appealing, especially to a knightly class. Oh, for sure. And also, I think another thing that's really important to, to state here is that you, on, on a deep psychological level, I think the Christians of the time really understood that this constant state of um, warring feudal uh, kingdoms uh, within the Christian world was actually quite sinful and that really they had been led astray by greed and avarice and uh, the, the nature of man. But in, in going and taking the warring kingdoms to the Muslims, the the infidels, you know, the pagans, they were actually able to 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 not not loophole because I, I think to say loophole gets away from the genuine religious conviction that they did feel, but it enables them to direct their uh, their military might at a true enemy of God and not just one another who are all actually actually Christians. Yeah, no, good point, good point. Look, that's one of the things Urban says. Um, Let's stop fighting each other. Come on, let's, mm. let's stop doing that. That's crazy. Yes. Uh, that, yes. It's all just going to end in tears if we don't stop doing that. So, <laughs> and, and all the while, there, is, um, th there are demons in Jerusalem. It, uh, you know, they've taken the mm. Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And that's another thing I want to mention real quick is that there was Santiago de Compostela, Rome, and Jerusalem. They're sort of the three biggest places of pilgrimage. There's also of points of pilgrimage across Europe, including Canterbury and things. But the Church of the Holy mm. Sepulchre in Jerusalem was the one, the number one. Well, it's where um, uh, Christ himself is supposed to have been buried. <laughs> so yes, um, to have that in the hands of of of, of evil evil Muslims, just <laughs> we, that we, that could not stand. <laughs> they would not stand for that. Um, so well, before before we get into the princes' crusade and and all the, the the big names, some of the big names of Europe who went out there, there was that, as I mentioned the People's Crusade led by um well a hermit called Peter the Hermit who just couldn't wait and got lots and lots yeah. of people. There's forty thousand. There's always um, one. Yeah, yeah. He just couldn't wait. Um, and just to cut that short, um, he does get as far as he gets into he gets to Constantinople, crosses the Bosphorus. It's into Anatolia, and then all they nearly all get uh, shot to pieces by a Seljuk arrows somewhere in the hills. <laughs> and uh, of course, there's there's a whole story to that, but um, I'm not going to dwell on that too much. Uh, but later it, that year, by well, by the next year, 1096, four massive contingents from across Europe get together and head down in the, in the summer of 1096 to Alexios's capital, Constantinople. And I suppose that's really where the, the, the action begins around there, isn't it? For sure. And I think at that point, just to slightly backtrack to, to Peter, I think mm -hmm. it's really interesting because it juxtaposes very well the when we talk about the atrocities of the Crusades and the uh, the evils done in the name of the Christians. For example, um, people often point to the fact that at the time of the Crusades, uh, particularly the, fir the first one, there was an enormous um, persecution of, of Jews in, in Europe to, to fund the Crusades and to, to take their money. But when, when I was reading about it, what was really interesting to, to learn was that actually Peter and his more people-powered populist crusade was really the one that was a bit more anarchist about that. They were willing to go and do those sorts of things to the Jews. But whereas the actual lords and barons who led the, the official crusade, as we could call it, they were of a more chivalric nature, of a more honourable nature, and they were a bit more above that, that sort of penny-pinching. Yeah, yeah, they do mention that there's a, a few pogroms, especially in what is modern day Germany. Um, mm. Yeah, the poor, the poor put upon Jews that absolutely didn't deserve it in any way, shape or form, no. we're told. Um, so the big, the big, we'll move on from that. The big, <laughs> four, four big armies were sent down then. Uh, uh, the, the first one, um, uh, Bohemond, Bohemond of Taranto. Uh, and his mm. his nephew Tancred. All, all these all these have got ve very different uh, personalities. 
and uh, each one of them is sort of a fantastic character in their own right, in my opinion. Uh, yes. But Beaumont is probably, well, is one of the main players. One of the others is, uh, and he's a, uh, he, Beaumont's a, a, a Norman. And so that's, mm. that's sort of important because there, there was, in the four big players or four or five or six big players on the First Crusade, they've all got their own, they've all got their own, uh, what's the word? Sort of, um, they've all got they've all got their own games that they're playing, their own motivations, and they're all looking out for themselves. Although they're all nominally trying to rescue the Church of the Holy Sepulchre from the Seljuk Turk, or by the time they get there from the uh, from the Fatimid uh, Muslims of of North, of North Africa. Um, but they've all they're all sort of uh, yeah got their own motivations, and uh, they, they, they sort of undermine each other and all that sort of thing. So Beaumont of Trento. And then there's Godfrey de Bouillon or Godfrey of Bouillon. Um, and then there's um, the, the, there's Raymond, Raymond of Toulouse, Count of Toulouse, Raymond the Fourth. Yes. He's, you know, these, yes. Are, these are the biggest players. Uh, and then there's also Robert Curtoz, uh, who is the, the first son of William the Conqueror. And um, yes, yes. And, uh, and um, so he's got a I very complicated jumping... story. Sorry, go ahead. Mm. No, sorry. I was just going to say, and I might be jumping the gun a little bit here, but there was definitely a member of the deposed Anglo-Saxon nobility who fought alongside the son of the conqueror, wasn't it? So that was actually quite a symbolic thing that, you know, you've got the Anglo-Saxon and the, and the Norman conqueror both fighting the same war together now in common purpose. But I can't remember the name of the Anglo-Saxon. Yeah, that's right. Edgar the Aetheling turns up at one that's point. It. Yeah. It's very interesting. In fact, there's a great line in uh, Churchill, uh, History of mm. English Speaking People, says, by a strange, um, this isn't verbatim, but he says, you know, by a strange quirk of fate, you've got the displaced heir of England, Edgar the Aetheling, and the displaced heir of William the Conqueror, Robert Curtos, fighting alongside each other in the Holy Land. Yeah, what a quirk mm. of fate that is. Yeah, no, absolutely. And Robert Curtos, or, or, or just Robert of Normandy, um, had just sort of deliberately left the Norman English theatre because he'd sort of been fighting his father and then his, his brother Rufus had, had uh, sort of bested him in all sorts of ways. Uh, but and, and, and he's got a bit of a reputation for being a failure in all sorts of senses. But on the crusade, he's, he's great. He's a, a valiant fighter, fights personally in the front and uh, makes great decisions and all sorts of things. And he's one of the big four, big five players. One of the others is another Robert, Robert, Robert of Flanders, uh, the Count of Flanders. Uh, and there's a few more. There's a, a Stephen of Blois. And um, hmm. uh, uh, what's what, what's the guy that ends up in in Antioch? It's uh, uh, oh, sorry, in Edessa. What's the uh, Baldwin? Baldwin of Boulogne. Another big. Oh, yes. yes Baldwin. Player. But I suppose the biggest ones you could say are uh, Bohemond, Godfrey uh, and Raymond. Um, so the, they all go down to Constantinople and start making a new uh, with uh, various pogroms and massacres along the way. And when they get to when they get to uh, Constantinople, um, again, Churchill says that Alexios, the Byzantine emperor, is embarrassed. It, it, you know, he's, he's sort of well, he's, it's a nice way of saying he's sort of scared in a way that these mm. three, four giant hosts turn up at his door he expected you know a few thousand very professional knights to come and help and he gets yeah, sure. something in the order of 40,000 people and 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 their baggage trains loads of civilians and they're all sort of religious zealots and stuff so he tries and ferries them across the Bosphorus as quickly as possible and yes uh, there's some what you wish for Byzantium and it's all a bit dirty go ahead mm. no I was just gonna say you know Alexius be careful what you wish for if you want, you know, a bunch of... I, I actually have a really nice quote here from uh, Fulcher of uh, Chatelet, um, when he, he talks about the, um, the composition of the crusading army. So he says, um, but whoever heard such a mixture of languages in one army? Uh, there were Franks, Flemish, Frisians, Gauls, Alabrogues, uh, Lotharchians, uh, Alamania, Bavarians, Normans, Angles, Scots, Aquitanians, Italians, Dacians, Apollonians, Iberians, Bretons, Greeks and Arminians. If a Breton or Teuton uh, questioned me, I would not know how to answer either. But though we spoke diverse languages, we were, however, brothers in the love of God and seemed to be nearest kin. For if one lost any of his possessions, whoever found it kept it carefully a long time, 
until by inquiry he found the loser and returned it to him. This was indeed the proper way for those who were making this whole holy pilgrimage in the right spirit. <laughs> yeah, great quote that, quite a famous quote, yeah. Mm. And it's, it's interesting to call it as a, um, an armed pilgrimage. Yeah, at what point does a, an armed pilgrimage become a crusade? Um, you know, that line is blurred. Um, mm. But certainly the uh, where the People's Crusade under Peter the Hermit had been cut to pieces not far into Anatolia, uh, you know, these uh, th these four armies n now sort of see, th there's one account of, uh, they see basically a massive pile of, of dead bodies where, they'd m m where, the, where the People's Crusade had, had uh, been, been ambushed, essentially, a giant ambush. Oof. And, uh, you know, that's quite an ominous thing. You know, mm. you, you haven't even got to Nicaea yet and you see the remains sort of a uh, ghostly remains of well just a, a, literally they say a, a mountain of bodies they say it's not a hill it's not a hillock of bodies it's a mountain obviously that is an exaggeration but nonetheless it, it, sure. it doesn't bode well does it but partic particularly at this time in history as well they would have taken that very very seriously um mm. you know mm. there would have undoubtedly have been rumor throughout the camp that this was an omen or, you know, a pretense of something to come, um, you know, because those sorts of things were very prevalent to be believed at the time. Yeah, absolutely. So a quick word to say about the uh, the Seljuk Turk or the, the, the Sultanate of Rum at the time. Hmm. Um, one of the, their main leader was a, a Kilij Arslan is his name, Kilij Arslan. And they were really still kind of not exactly nomads, but they were nomadic type people, horse archers hmm. in a sense. Although mm. they'd been civilized, they weren't purely step archers. They were a bit more than that, but not a fantastic amount more. They they'd taken their capital as Nicaea, which of course is a very ancient and um, venerable city. You know, uh, the Nicaean Creed back when Con Constantine the Great, Constantine the First, fourth century, that sort of um, well, Nicaea is venerable. That's what we need. That's what you need to know. And Kilij Arslan yes. has made it his capital, where his treasury was and his family, and. The Crusaders go down there, and one of the first big set pieces is the Siege of Nicaea. And, yes. Um, go, go ahead, if you want to say something about that. Oh, well, I was just going to say, it's really interesting how it comes back to Nicaea, because I, I think one thing, just to um, give some uh, meat on the bones to the, uh, the way that things were at the time, um, Nicaea, obviously, as you pointed out, was the uh, where Constantine held his council where the, the first sort of big Christian debate was on, whether um, uh, over Arianism, whether God and Jesus were, were one in the same, and whether uh, Jesus was in fact divine or just immortal. And it's very interesting that under Muslim rule, um, because Isla Islam had had an hegemony, um, and it was the only true religion. The Muslims didn't actually pay that much attention to the sort of inner little squabbles of all the religious um, minorities at the time. So there was actually quite a lot of Aryans living around the Middle East at this time because the Muslims hadn't paid them any attention. So then to bring it all the way back to Nicaea, it's interesting to see that actually, once again, this is a turning point and that even a thousand almost you know about 800 years later that council has actually led to uh, it, that, that those Aryans haven't been crushed they're actually more prevalent than ever yeah no absolutely yeah so the Nicaean creed the first second and third but the first and third councils of Nicaea are uh, um, sort of very important and yeah, as I mentioned, the, the Great Schism, which had taken place in the 1050s, was over mm. the Nicene Creed, where, where the Orthodox and the uh, Catholic churches, the, the Catholic Church in the West had sort of tweaked the wording a bit. <laughs> and the Eastern Church, the Orthodox Church was not going to have that, not happy with that. Um, no. There's much, much, much more to it. That's very low resolution. However, the point remains that the Nicene Creed from the fourth century was now being had now split the church in half in the 11th century. And it is from the town of Nicaea, which is in modern day Turkey. Um, and that's where the Crusaders turn up. It was Kilij Ars Arslan's uh, capital. And um, well, there was a, quite a protracted siege at Nicaea. But eventually, you know, just to cut it short, eventually the Crusaders get in 
and they, they take it and um, uh, Gilead Jarsland's family are taken hostage and um, all sorts of things. And Tancred, <laughs> Tancred, uh, Bohemond's nephew, uh, gets involved, gets stuck in. He's he's uh, mm. he's not afraid to get stuck in his old Tancred. He's oh, one yeah. of my favourites, Tancred, I must say, uh, straight off the bat. And when I say favourites, <laughs> I don't mean I like him. He would have been a terrible butcherous type person, a horrible person. But in terms of just a historical character, he's sort of fasc- right. fascinating, larger than life. Yeah, really. it's it's that thing isn't it he he embodies what it means to be a crusader um <laughs> in the same way that you think well what does it mean to you know what is the embodiment of a knight you'd be like oh well it's william marshall you know you just he encapsulates tancred encapsulates what what was required of the christians at the times in order to secure victory yeah, absolutely. And bold as brass, he was one that he sort of refused to pay homage to Alexios, which was sort of the whole point. I'll oh, just to mention the whole point of it was that if they take a city, they then hand it straight back to the Byzantine emperor. That was the idea mm. of this whole crusade is to to reconquer the Byzantine Empire on behalf of the Byzantine Empire. So when you take a city like Heraclea or Nicaea or something, you then give it back immediately to the Byzantine generals and they were still doing it at this point but it didn't last forever did it it's so adorably naive though isn't it (laughs) (laughs) to to think that that was going to last and Tancred out of all the main players sort of refused to sort of formally pay homage to Alexios and and and, you know give him fealty and, and swear an oath until they get to Nicaea and then he sort of basically in all sorts of political ways forced to do so but when they leave Nicaea, there's a little anecdote, a little story I think is interesting, where he sort of stared, because Alexios then came down to Nicaea to see his new gains, and apparently Tancred like, stared him in the eye and said, like, you're not a friend, I consider you an enemy, I have just sworn an oath to you, but I, I don't like you, you're an enemy. I mean, the brass balls on the guy, you know, there's just... <laughs> yeah. It's a cr- incredible, really. But it comes down to that thing as well, isn't it, that... You can say, oh, well, we're going to, you know, basically rebuild your empire for you. But if they're the ones doing all the heavy lifting, you would naturally feel a bit entitled to some of the spoils, to some of the castles, to some of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. No, you're right. You're right. And so they move on to uh, sort of central Turkey, central Anatolia, uh, Dorylaeum. There's a big battle at Dorylaeum. And uh, uh, well, here, Bohemond and Kurtos get sort of, they were right at the front of the army. Because, of course, this army, sort of four armies, really, very, very long and strung out. And at one point uh, around uh, Dorylaeum, uh, Bohemond and Robert Kurtos are right at the very front and sort of get separated a bit and encircled by a, a, a fairly large Seljuk contingent, sort of 12,000 men. They get completely surrounded and looks like they're going to be killed to a man, but just about hold out long enough. Um, and that's just a great, a great moment, especially for any Kurtos fans. And, and it shows that the Crusaders are sort of all in. They're prepared to, you know, they're not just going to run away. They're not sort of a civilian band. They're sort of professional soldiers that will fight to the last man and do seem to be. Um, well, there's no other way to put it other than they're sort of r- religious zealots, professional soldiers and religious zealots at the same time. And um, a lot of these people, like like Raymond, it doesn't ever expect to go back to France or anything. So there's another thing to say that a lot of these, mm. Kurtos is an, uh, not a good example because he does end up going back to Normandy, straight England area. Mm. But a lot of these guys want to try and carve out a kingdom for themselves in the East. It's one that, you know, nominally on paper, the first objective is to retake Jerusalem and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. But also, quite a lot of them are sort of true adventurers in the sense that they want to try and, if they can, carve out a principality for themselves, a county, a small kingdom for themselves forever. And, you know, set yeah. up the, you know, set up uh, and make a, a um, um, what's it called? Uh, uh, when you have a... a Bloody hell, what's the word? Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, when, when a monarchy has a whole dynasty, that's the word. <laughs> Try and set yes, up a whole yeah, dynasty. Yeah, their own dynasties. Yeah. Well, it, it's that thing, isn't it? That as you as we'd previously talked about, these a lot of these people 
leading the Crusades are, are not the kings of Europe. They're they're the second sons. You know, mm. these are mm. these are people by primogeniture who would not have expected to really have gotten anything. You know, to 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 flash forward quite a bit. Richard the Lionheart is a good example of this. He wasn't the first son, and he was always warring with his father Henry. He didn't um, expect to to win a kingdom. He obviously eventually did, but it's very true for a lot of these people here on the First Crusade, they were never going to get anything back in their own lands in in the West. So this is the perfect opportunity for them to win their own glory, their own honour, and to really make a name for themselves in their own right, to come out of the shadows of the firstborns, as it were. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, like um, uh, Hugh de Vermenois or, or uh, Robert of Flanders. Uh, well, it's not a coincidence that we, we mentioned earlier that Edgar the Eighthling and Robert Curto is both displaced sons. It's a very good point you make that these are sort of um, sort of secondary uh, rulers in Europe. Um, so yeah, I mean, like Godfrey de Bouillon or, or Bohemond of uh, Bohemond of Taranto. I mean, they're not sort of giant. They're not sort of the king like the Third Crusade. They are actual kings, the King of England, the King of France on that. But these are sort of lesser nobles. Only and they're still sort of they're still sort of very powerful men. You know, oh, yeah. able to raise large sums of money and, and thousands and thousands of knights. But, yeah, they're not the actual, the very uh, tippy top of society. Not yet. Anyway, that's no, a good point. Very good point to, to make. Uh, like <laughs> Baldwin of Boulogne, you know, it's just it's just Boulogne. It's not France, yeah. I think. You know. um, no. So the next big thing to mention after um, after Dorylaeum is that they moved down to Antioch, which is sort of a really key sort of when you look mm. at the map, sort of an obvious and key thing that they should take. Uh, I have heard it said, or it is true, I suppose, that they could have bypassed Antioch. You didn't have to take Antioch in order to capture Jerusalem. But in a way, you kind of did. It was kind of, it would be very, very difficult. You'd be cutting off your supply lines if you didn't take Antioch. Anyway, the point is, is that they didn't necessarily have to take Antioch, but they decided they're going to because it's a great, great prize. I mean, centuries ago... It had been the third greatest city in the in the Roman world. You, you sort of had Rome, Constantinople, and um, and then uh, Antioch. In, in, and the church at Antioch was extremely venerable, and all sorts of. Oh things. yes. But it had fallen into Seljuk hands, um, and the Crusaders decide they're going to besiege Antioch in in 1098 or 1097 into 98 over the winter, and that is sort of a nine month long set piece a very 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 brutal siege where also you know until now it's been relatively easy i mean i'm putting a, a rosy spin on that nicaea wasn't easy but compared to antioch the siege of antioch in 1098 is uh you know it's a real harrowing one isn't it yeah yeah for sure and obviously just all of the generic things that you would expect to to happen in a medieval uh, siege, you know, dysentery, fever, typhoid fever, obviously, all these sorts of things setting in around them. I, I can't quite remember geographically. Antioch isn't on the coast, is it? Or is it's, it? It's, it's right near the coast. It's not right on. It's not on the coast, but it's not no. a million miles away from the coast. Yes. So obviously that that gives it an, an even greater significance to take then, because if it's really near to the coast, then it presents a, an opportunity for the Crusaders to keep fun, fueling the war effort because they can send ships down the Mediterranean uh, to Antioch to keep, you know, re replenishing their supplies and, and troops and all these sorts of things that they need if they're going to win. That's right. At one point, or more than one point, the Byzantines send ships, multiple ships, to the coast, which again isn't a million miles away; it's just a few miles. Antioch's only a few miles inland, and the Byzantines send ships down to sort of uh, with supplies and all sorts of things. A few times, not quite enough, but they do do that. So yeah, it's it's fairly near the coast, to be quite honest. Um, now Antioch, the topography, the actual physical reality of Antioch is that it's extremely easy to defend, or to put it another way, extremely difficult to take. Um, just the way that the, the mountains and the rivers are and the way the walls are built, it's very, very difficult to take. It's one of those ones where, even though the Crusaders, the sort of Frankish and Latin 11th century Crusaders, were uh, used to siege warfare and building building ramps 
and building siege towers and building catapults and all sorts of things, it was still a, a big ask to get in. And uh, well, ultimately, they're probably going to looking at trying to have to starve the map rather than taking the walls. And um, it just doesn't go well for them. I mean, it's a long protracted thing uh, where uh, 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 it's just <laughs> all sorts of sallies on both sides. There's a great citadel at, at Antioch. High up on a, on a on a ridge, essentially, where uh, whoever holds that can look down and see everything, can see what any attacker is doing. So there's no element of surprise. Um, mm. They try to sort of effectively starve them out, but it doesn't go well. And there's lots of disease in the in the Crusader camp. And one thing to start mentioning now is that the different big players in it start sort of well. There's there's infighting. It's as simple as that between who sort yeah. of. The main player between Beaumont and Godfrey and uh, Raymond, uh, you know, Raymond of Toulouse, who's sort of the most important person, who's going to get the spoils if and when they do get inside and all that sort of thing. So factionalism within the Crusader camp is uh, sort of becomes a huge, huge thing now. Yes, yes, for sure. I, I think it's really as well just to to mention that in terms of uh, the siege of uh, uh, no, sorry. What what I wanted to ask you was: Are the Muslims accustomed to being under actual siege from from war machines, from towers and trebuchets? I know that these are quite these are mostly European inventions, but to what extent had the Muslims already had contact with this sort of machinery before? Yeah. Oh no, they had. Yeah, they're no. Uh, uh, well Seljuks have uh, come all the way from Central Asia, so they've sort of seen it all before. <laughs> right. Okay. Not yes. everything. Maybe not everything. Uh, you know, this is uh, they. They had. It just depends which source you you read. Uh, mm. But uh, there were some new things they wouldn't have seen before on the First Crusade. But they they, it, they weren't completely green by any stretch of the imagination. They knew what they were doing. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, because in the end, they are able to. They are able to just hold Antioch effectively. Uh, uh, indefinitely, um, and the only way, in the end, that the Crusaders are able to break the siege and get inside is that uh, it is an inside job. <laughs> Somebody called Farouz, mm -hmm. who who controls one of the towers at uh, Antioch, uh, betrays them and sort of lowers a ladder down one night. But you know, specifically one night, lowers a ladder down, and Bohemond yeah. himself and some of his men climb up this sort of rope ladder get inside and uh, are, and are able to sort of break the siege that way. In fact, there's a very, uh, there's a famous or a very great in carving by Gustav Dorr. I'll, I'll put it up in post-production so everyone can see it. Hmm. It's very, very evocative in my opinion. I love it. Um, where lucky. Bohemond himself and a few of his bravest knights are able to get inside this one specific tower at Antioch and, um, you know, open it up from there, break it open from there. And when the Crusaders get in, which is a story repeated very often, um, there's just a, almost a wholesale massacre. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you're Muslim or Christian or a Gentile or a Jew or anything. Every, nearly everyone, man, woman and children, is sort of slaughtered, basically. So, um, yeah, and not, yeah. not everyone, of course, but there is a terrible, no. terrible uh, massacre there. It, it's, um, I, it's just so prevalent, isn't it, in almost, I mean, you know, I, I wouldn't say it happened very often. The Europeans didn't, do that level of carnage to one another did they normally back in western europe this is a a, a level of massacre that uh, on both sides you know the muslims obviously did it to the christians as well but this is definitely a sort of thing that really became prevalent during the crusades themselves just wholesale massacring of of the cities um, am i right in thinking that yeah i mean it wasn't unprecedented but it was rare yeah the, mm. the, there'd usually need to be a reason um you know <laughs> there yes. wouldn't normally need to be a reason um but yeah i mean it's quite rare um but yeah in the crusades both sides do 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 it to each other at various points but um this uh, once they once the crusaders get into antioch in 1098 is sort of one of the worst ones a uh, quick thing to mention um mm. just in, in broadly here is that during that time jerusalem itself is taken from the seljuks by the fatimids the fatimid caliphate the mm. fatimid muslims from north africa really and egypt 
um, like during this time in that year, we're in 1097, I think, or 1097 or 1098, Jerusalem switches hands from the Seljuks to the Fatimids. So when the Crusaders get down there, just to jump ahead of so slightly, in the following mm. year, in 1099, that's the big year, 1099, Jerusalem has sort of freshly changed hands. So that's something to bear in mind. That's something to, to mention there. And anyway, when the Crusaders get inside Antioch, a relieving army, a giant relieving army from um, sort of deeper inside the Levant of sort of 30,000, maybe more, 30,000 odd Muslims comes to what they thought was to have a battle with the Crusaders, only to find that the Crusaders are now inside Antioch. So yeah. the Crusaders very, very quickly go from from uh, besieging uh, Antioch to being besieged with inside Antioch. <laughs> they're, they're now inside and close the gates. And and so the tables are turned there. And that goes on for quite a while, weeks and weeks, no, months, months. And there's all sorts of sallies out and the Crusaders try and get more because because they're being starved now. Mm. They haven't got enough wood or enough f uh, clean water or enough food. And so they're being starved. And it looks like they're going to be starved out, starved to death. But then there's an important um, episode where... <laughs> one of the one of the preachers in their in their contingent decides that there's the ho a holy spear the spear that pierced Christ's side it, he's had a dream that uh, in one of the churches that the spear is there and it will be a great relic because people believed in holy relics massively back in oh those sure days. well uh, there's another one from Antioch isn't there there's a the holy hand grenade of course so <laughs> yeah of course <laughs> yeah the holy... <laughs> The holy hand grenade of Antioch, yeah. Um, exactly. The funny thing about this spear is that it actually already was in Constantinople and the Crusaders oh, had okay. seen it. The Crusaders themselves had seen it in Constantinople a couple of years earlier. But right. no, now apparently it is actually buried under a church inside Antioch. Anyway, they dig it up and claim that they've got it now. And uh, the, all the accounts say that um, this sort of turned around the Crusaders' morale. They suddenly went from being starved and well, no esprit de corps and just waiting to die to um, well, 180, just being prepared to at least sally out in some sort of last 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 ditch effort, Hail Mary suicide mission to to sally out of Antioch and attack this giant army that's besieging them. And anyway, that's what they do. And incredibly, success, incredibly, it's successful. Now, this is one of the points in the First Crusade where it's sort of, of course, if you're sort of uh, Western centric, it's sort of an incredible moment. It's sort of, it's almost unbelievable. You know, it's one of those things where you think, mm. well, everything could have changed that day, that afternoon. The whole history of the Crusades and the whole history between the East and the West could have been very different if that had gone differently. It just seems mm. sort of, crazy and you can see how people at the time thought that it was sort of uh, divinely ordained that the crusaders should go on and should win because that was so against the odds so incredibly against the odds that that the crusaders would sally out at that moment or almost being starved to death with no energy outnumbered and 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 they win that encounter um, just incredible it's a bit like what um, I remember listening to your epoch with Carl on, on Agincourt. It gives me that same sort of reminder. Mm. It's when, when mm. your back is absolutely up against the wall and mm. it, it's it's fight or death. And and you know that you are the only army that, that is in the Holy Land right now. You're the only army that has any chance of taking back jerusalem if you, if you go it all goes you know the entire weight of christianity rests upon your shoulders right now what are you going to do about it that's yeah. that that's a powerful thing yeah no absolutely absolutely that um um i'll just say luca i'm doing quite a lot of the talking here what might be cool is if i go through and carry on with sort of this dynamic and then we can go and we'll talk about the third crusade and i'll let you do much more of the talking. How about that? If you've oh, yeah, done lots of great. research and reading into that, is that all yeah, right? Yeah, no, that'd be yeah, that'd be absolutely lovely. Yeah, no, I'm yeah. I'm really enjoying this though because you're you're certainly fleshing out for me a, a lot of the uh, the parts. I mean, for example, I had no idea about the spear. Um, 
and and that's strange because it feels like such a a, a centerpiece to the actual story of the siege and yet i just i didn't know about it so i'm really glad to learn along with the audience in a way actually just a quick side note then on that the guy the the mm -hmm. uh the uh, holy man who claimed that uh, later goes on to almost set himself up um, in his own right. And he pushes his luck a bit too far where people sort of lose faith in him and uh, make him go through an ordeal of fire, make him with his spear, his so-called relic, walk through a giant fire, a giant fire. <laughs> and, uh, and he's so convinced that he's correct that he does. He walks through it. Well, he hasn't much of a choice. It's an ordeal by fire. And right. he comes out the other side, just, you know, completely, com almost completely incinerating, like melting. All his flesh is melting off of him. And um, <laughs> yeah, and it's horrible. It's really horrible. But it's like, yeah, yeah he thought he thought the flames wouldn't d hurt him. <laughs> anyway, right. That's the 11th yeah. century for you. <laughs> yeah, no, it's fantastic. It's like that, that Greek philosopher um, who I can't remember which one who jumped into the volcano because he was convinced he'd survive it. You know, it's just, you yeah, know, people get delusions of grandeur it. sometimes. Yes. Yeah, Epidemies, it's funny you should mention that because uh, there's a, I, I did a, um, a a talk with Stelios on Epochs recently and we mentioned him. Um, yeah, it's ridiculous. <laughs> he thought the, yeah. the, he thought it was a god and that he proved to everyone that um, lava couldn't hurt him. And of course, yeah. he was incinerated to a crisp immediately. Um, <laughs> to be fair so, to him, if anything was, going, was, yes. was yes. sorry, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, if it, if to be fair to him, if anything was going to prove it, it, <laughs> it would have been the fact that it had survived lava. That would have done it. So he picked the right type of thing to to give <laughs> for proof. Yeah, that would have done it for me if, if I if I needed convincing. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Empedocles, that was it, Empedocles, yeah, one of the, ah, okay. the pre-Socratics. Um, mm. So, um, back to the crusade, after after finally the massive ordeal of, of the siege of Antioch, um, it sort of squabbled over, that there's almost really a, a, a civil war, really, almost really, between the, the, the big players, certainly between Bohemond and uh, Raymond. Um, mm. There's a big uh, neither of them will, will give in and let the other sort of rule be the ruler of Antioch. And so the the crusade really splits into two big camps at that point over, you know, whether you give your allegiance to, to Bohemond or, or Raymond. Um, also, another point just to mention that around this time, literally about this exact time, Baldwin of Boulogne goes off to Edessa, which is much more inland. I'll put a map up again so everyone can see. Um, mm -hmm. Goes off to Edessa and sets himself up in Edessa uh, at first with only about 100 knights, um, but many more follow him in, in subsequent years and generations. And that's that's held by the, the Franks, by the Latins, by the sort of Western knights. It's held for hundreds of years. And mm. again, it just shows you this thing that a lot of them aren't necessarily there just to rescue the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Lots of them are there to sort of just for their own interests, to set themselves up. Um, and, and oh and yeah, for sure. treasure and lands just for themselves. And 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 the, and the thing is as well, they the, they can spin it any way they want. It's not inconceivable that you can just say, well, I've you know I, I came all this way and look look how much good I've already done for the crusade. You know <laughs> you can you you know everyone sure. And uh, another thing as well is that uh, you know Urban the second that the mandate of the Crusades was was in part Jerusalem, but it was also just to liberate the churches. Um, a very general and sort of nebulous goal. You know, it's like, well, how many of them? You know, all of them or, or just a few of them? You know, so he can easily, he, he has an easy out, um, yeah. is what I'm saying. Yeah. And remember, a lot of these uh, so-called Frankish knights or but a lot of them are from all over the place from modern day Germany and things they would all still be um, Catholic essentially and so mm. they're rescuing these churches that are sort of orthodox churches um, so that just adds another element to it um, again in pretty much everything we're mentioning here there's so much more detail to it we're really just doing an overview aren't we to be perfectly honest um, so after Antioch 
the Crusaders or big parts, not all of it, but big parts of the crusading host moved down. They, there's a big siege at Marat, um, where again, there's a big massacre there. A uh, whole story about getting inside the walls of Marat. They go on, they go down to Acre, um, and there's, uh, they, there's all sorts of problems at Acre. They don't get into Acre very quickly at all. Um, at one point, they go off to Jaffa, which seems to have been completely abandoned. The whole the whole town of Jaffa is almost abandoned. Um, at one point, Tancred goes off to Bethlehem to sort of oh, rescue really? Bethlehem from uh, for, from the Turk from from the Muslims. Um, mm. He's sort of extremely proud of doing that. But then it comes to this point where some people are annoyed by that because Tancred sets up a flag in Bethlehem as though to say, "This is mine. This is my land now." And people were like, "Well, that's terribly." <laughs> Lots of people at the time in the Crusader camp are like, "Well, that's you know very irreligious." <laughs> yeah, that, that's the birthplace of our lord. It's, it doesn't mm. belong to you. Yeah, it belongs to all of us. Yeah, exactly. And 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 um, I mean, it, then it gets to the point where people like Boromond and Raymond have to decide what what they're really doing. Uh, why are they there? Is it is it uh, are they trying to help the Byzantine Emperor Alexios to to retake his old he, he, the, you know the the eastern portion of the Eastern Roman Empire, or are they there because Urban asked them to retake the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, or are they there to set themselves up entirely in their own right, or is it a mixture? Which is probably the real answer. Is it a mixture of all those things? So the question, Raymond, is what do you want to be? You know. Um, I uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the film Fight Club, but uh, uh, oh yes, quite, yes, of course. So I'll, I'll throw that in. Um, <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> let's get to the uh, the denouement of the piece. Eventually, mm. a Crusader army gets outside the walls of Jerusalem, sort of incredibly, but they realise now that they can't do a nine month long siege of Jerusalem. And Jerusalem is you know heavily girded, strongly girded Jerusalem. It's got giant stone walls. It's not easy to get inside at all. And the Fatimids, although they haven't got sort of a giant uh, garrison, they are still, there is still like a, a very, very real defence going on. So the Crusaders realise that, you know, we can't try and starve them out. That's just not on the cards here. We've got to do one sort of, one sort of big push, if we can, somewhere against the walls and just try and get in as quickly as possible, because if this becomes a long, drawn out thing, it's not going to go well for us. Um, well, and so in, just to cut that short, I suppose, going to have to, um, they do eventually get in there. There's a, there's a giant ramp built and there's uh, some siege engines, some very apparently very, very good siege engines, sort of three story tall siege engines. And, uh, uh, and the defenders use Greek fire famously wow. all over the place yes. greek fire and uh, the crusaders were told that you can put greek fire out not with water uh, but with vinegar apparently oh really <laughs> and so they're able to do that yeah there's accounts of that and anyway it's all very messy but long story short eventually one of these siege towers uh, uh they do it is able to sort of uh take the top of one of the bits of the walls in Jerusalem. Now, there's a psychological thing going on at this point because literally, as soon as some crusaders uh, top the wall, um, mm. the word yeah. goes around Jer Jerusalem that, that, that the Franks are inside, and it seems like the Fatimid Muslim morale just absolutely disintegrates at that point. Like people just, on the uh, defending the other side of the city just give in and they just collapse. Their morale just absolutely collapses, which is kind of what the the western knights needed you know if that didn't happen yeah. if they put up some sort of crazy leningrad stalingrad style defense it would have been very difficult for the knights but but that's not what happened i i think uh, something else that's really uh, would be a good time to bring up is uh, the difference whilst we're talking about the siege of jerusalem which is obviously what does jerusalem mean to the two sides that are actually at war with it here. And one of the things that I found very interesting when I was reading about this is that Jerusalem is obviously, has obviously always been um, significant to Christians for as long as Christianity has has existed because it is the place of the death of, of Jesus Christ. So that's a very 
easy and, and it says as much in the bible so that's a very easy thing to to link to christianity and it's obviously a very and as you say you know the holy sepulcher is in there you know there's a lot um within jerusalem that is worth the christians putting this effort in for the muslims however it's a little bit different because in the case of the muslims um right at the moment um in our modern times jerusalem is of course regarded as the third most holy city in in islam after mecca and um uh, is it medina um and but but one of the important points is that actually the, the holiness and the sacredness of Jerusalem to Muslims was actually something that the Crusades kind of gave birth to. It's a very the, the, the holiness of Jerusalem is a very retroactive thing for the Muslims because it's supposed to have been where Muhammad arrived at the end of his night journey after he was. Um, uh, guided across the land by 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 one of the archangels and so but they in the quran it's not actually clear where that is it just says the furthest mosque but the mm. furthest mosque in muhammad's time wouldn't have been jerusalem it mm. would have been medina so but they've retroactively said oh well it was jerusalem so it's actually a bit different in that regards. It's not, it doesn't, at the time of the Crusades, it doesn't have, uh, certainly the first one, it doesn't have that level of sacredness that it does to the Christians. Mm. Yeah, no, good point. I mean, because today, of course, there's the, the Dome of the Rock. Um, mm. uh, uh, <clears throat> so, yeah, all the, all the three uh, Abrahamic religions uh, count Jerusalem as, uh, you know, uh, the most sacred place, really. But for the Christians, you know, there's so many things that are mentioned in in the gospels that are in jerusalem you know the mount of olives uh the gardens of gethsemane you know there, there's just there's, there's just yeah it couldn't be sort of more holy as far as the christians mm. are concerned um <clears throat> pardon me. um and well when they do get inside uh, again there's a uh, some sort of frightful massacre doesn't really matter if you're a, a fatimid or a christian particularly it's just looting large-scale looting <laughs> and uh and well, I suppose the thing to mention is that they, uh, the, it's uh, God, Godfrey, Godfrey de Bouillon um, is sort of uh, by that point, because lots of politics has gone on, um, Raymond has sort of fallen, Raymond of, of Toulouse, the Count of Toulouse has sort of fallen from grace. Originally, he was really the leader. If there was going to be one sort of preeminent leader, it would have been Raymond, but he's sort of, for, for political reasons, isn't. At the, at the top anymore and and godfrey of bouillon is and um they want to crown him king of jerusalem but at least mm. at first he rejects that and uh he says he's not going to wear a, a crown in christ's holy city where, where the king of kings would have reigned um he yes. can't that, that would be too irreligious for him to call himself the king of jerusalem to begin with at least so he just calls himself the what is it like the protector of the uh, of the holy yes, sepulchre i think it's protector yes yeah <clears throat> protector of the of the holy sepulchre and so you know the crusaders aren't ousted from jerusalem for uh generations and generations and generations before it's finally taken mm. back by uh muslim armies um and so i mean there's, there's so much more that can be said on literally every single one of the points we've we've talked about so far there's uh, uh, probably an hour or so could be said, <laughs> but um, yes, if we're going to move on hours. and talk about, yeah, sorry, go on. Ed. Uh, go ahead. I was just going to say, um, actually, on the on the matter of the sack of Jerusalem, because mm. this is obviously um, very remembered. It's a very infamous part of history, you know. Supposedly. Mm. Mm. You know the, the Christians massacred everyone they could find within Jerusalem to to purify it. But and there's there's talk of uh, the uh, you know the mosques being knee high with with blood. But mm. I, I have a really interesting quote here from um, Thomas F. Madden in his New Concise History, where he says stories of the streets of Jerusalem coursing with knee high rivers of blood were never meant to be taken seriously. Medieval people knew such a thing to be an impossibility. Modern people, unfortunately, do not. 
Um, so I just wondered what you made of that quote. Yeah, of course, it's very interesting. Yeah, the idea that uh, that streets can run knee high with blood is, of course, absurd. <laughs> yes, absurd. totally. Um, but I've heard accounts that um, you know thousands of people were sort of slain, or that in in the siege of Antioch, actually, they said the streets, most of the streets in Antioch, are really, really narrow. You know, sort of that classic medieval or even pre-medieval style of town planning i.e no real town planning and the streets are very very narrow and that you couldn't you couldn't walk down some of the streets without treading on uh, walking over a carpet of dead bodies right wow now i can believe yeah. that i can believe that mm. um, yeah i do that too. Some streets. I do too. but the idea that the, that the streets of jerusalem were knee high with blood or that everyone in jerusalem was killed well no of course not that is uh, an exaggeration certainly yeah um, but some people that are sort of not very well versed in history or don't even really have a great grasp on reality, <laughs> quite a lot of people in our day and age, you can say that about, um, they'll just believe what they're, what they're told. They might just believe a line like that. Um, but yeah, it's not really, it's not actually plausible, is it? No, no, not at all. No. Uh, but yeah, it's interesting as well for you to say that, uh, as you say about Godfrey becoming protector of mm. Jerusalem and then I, th I think Godfrey dies after a year doesn't he and um, so Baldwin the first becomes the first king of Jerusalem Baldwin mm. isn't under any sort of pretenses that he wants mm. to be anything other than king um, mm. so it's interesting that that literally lasts less than a year before mm. there's already a king of Jerusalem yeah, that's right. Godfrey had been very, very ill for most of the, well, most of the second half of the crusade. He'd been very ill. He would sort of didn't play a giant part in Antioch for big parts of it because he was just ill. People thought he might die at any moment. Um, so, yeah, that's sort of his story. Um, well, what I, I'm thinking suppose... to say is... Oh, sorry, go on. Go oh, no, no, please, no, please go uh, ahead. You... Oh, I was just going to say, obviously, uh, and also after the uh, the taking of Jerusalem, this is obviously one of the most important things to happen in the whole of the Crusades, but obviously mm. um, the, the, the founding of the Templar Order, mm. uh, you know, takes place with uh, Hugh de Payne um, and 12 of his knights and their, I, I can't remember the, unfortunately, the long name, but they're, uh, and obviously they become protectors for the pilgrims who are going to be making the journey to, to Jerusalem for, for, for their whole group, holy pilgrimages. Yeah, the Templars, the order is um, is well, the temple in the name Templars is the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. Yeah, yeah yes, quite right. that was it. Yes, yes. So, uh, yeah, um, of course we get a, get a bit Dan Brown about conspiracy theories about the Templars, but a, a fascinating order. <laughs> in fact, orders like the Templars and the Hospitallers uh, uh, entirely come out of the Crusades, really. And mm. so, one thing to mention then, as we move on through time, is that there's really this idea of sort of a crusading spirit, which is intergenerational. It goes on for, well, hundreds of years. Um, there are many, many crusades. I think, <coughs> obviously, the first crusade, the great crusade, is sort of the big, the big one, really, in a way, the main one. The second crusade is gigantic. In terms of numbers, I think it's a lot bigger, but ultimately, ultimately isn't successful. The third crusade is the one we're going to talk about in a moment with Richard mm. the Lionheart. The yeah. fourth crusade is sort of a, a strange one, and that's where Constantinople gets sort of utterly raised almost. Yes. And they're sort of the big four. There are lots and lots, but I consider the first four to be the main ones. They're the ones where I think it's fair to say that history is completely moulded by. Like the first four crusades really make a massive difference to sort of the narrative of history, both European and Near Eastern, um, all, all f uh, for very different reasons. The first four. Um, yes, I we're gonna, agree. We're going to skip over the second one here because we, maybe we could chat again another time because I could easily, uh, there's lots and lots to say about the Second Crusade. It's a massive thing. But mm. what happened, uh, there was a slight miscommunication between us and uh, you thought we were going to do the Third Crusade. I thought we were going to do the First Crusade. Um, so I've done my bit here on the on the first crusade. We're going to skip over the second crusade a bit, and just to mention once more, that is a massive thing. But we're going to talk about yes. it now. I'm going to let you 
take the reins a bit and talk all about the third crusade which you know isn't i don't think it's quite well it's not as as seismic as the first crusade but it, it in my opinion what do you think about this is that it's more romantic in a way um it's sort of it, it, it sort of I, I think there's a few higher water marks of chivalry and r the, the story of the Coeur de Lyon, Richard the Lionheart, Richard I, and the Third Crusade and Saladin, for me, is sort of, it doesn't get more medieval than that. You know, it's like the, the chivalry, the, the, the higher water mark of the age of chivalry. And so if you want to go ahead and start telling me all about the Third Crusade. Yeah, goodness. Wow. OK, so I think the first... Um, also, I uh, I agree with your point. It's definitely the most romantic. Um, I think one of the reasons for that as well is very much grounded in, in the context of it. So um, I, I'll open with this. So this is a obviously after the, the First Crusade and the, the founding of um, what is sort of collectively known as Altrama, you know, the, uh, the, the Crusade and kingdoms of of the middle of the Arab uh, world, there is um, obviously four main um, constituencies. We'll call them. So you've got the county of Edessa, you've got the principality of Antioch, the county of Tripoli, and then the kingdom of Jerusalem. And they all, uh, the kingdom of Jerusalem is obviously the one with the paramount authority. But generally speaking, as we touched on with the the first crusade, they're all they're all quite self interested in themselves. So I have a I have a quote here. When I get to the right page, here we are. So William William of Tyre in 1174 um, was contemplating why, since the crusaders had taken the Holy Land in the First Crusade, why the more modern crusaders were taking on quite a bit of bad luck and constantly slowly getting chipped away by, by the Muslims. And so if you don't mind, it's quite a it's a bit of a long quote, but um, I think it's probably worth reading to, to set out the stall, if that's OK. Yeah, no, please do. But one thing just super quick to say is that by the mm. Third Crusade, we are sort of 70, 80, 90 years later, aren't we? Yes, yes. Um, Go ahead. And it's an interesting overlap as well. Does does the Third Crusade start in um, eleven eighty nine when mm -hmm. when the Crusaders sort of land and start fighting back, or or does it start before the fall of Jerusalem with like the Battle of Hattin? Yes. But anyway, so William of Tyre, eleven seventy four. He says the question is often asked, and quite justly. Why it was that our fathers, though less in number, so often bravely withstood in battle the far larger forces of the enemy. In contrast to this, the men of our time too often have been conquered by inferior forces. And so he gives to this um, question that he puts to himself, he gives three answers. He says, first, our forefathers were religious men and feared God. Now in their places are are a wicked generation that has grown up. Uh, he says, second, uh, they are unused to the art of war, unfamiliar with the rules of battle and gloried in the state of inactivity. And then third, he says, in former times, almost every city had its own ruler, but now all the kingdoms round about us obey one ruler. They do the will of one man, and at this, at his command alone, however reluctantly, they are ready as a unit to take up arms for our injury. Not one amongst them is free to um, indulge any inclination of his own, or may with impunity disregard the command of his overlord. So what he's obviously driving at here is a lack of um, individual crusaders to take the initiative and do things of their own accord if they feel it's in defense of the Holy Land. They all have to take their, their marching orders from a rather ineffective king of Jerusalem. So I think this these three reasons are um, actually quite a fair reflection of why the Crusaders' states have diminished by the time of the Third and why the Third is necessary. Um, what are your thoughts on that? 
yeah well the world has moved on hasn't it the world has changed um mm. i would say that i think during the first crusade the, the 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 muslim world the various parts of the muslim world both the fatimid sultanate and the various uh, seljuk uh, uh sultanates uh, were mm. quite fractious they're quite um yeah they, they were in a they were a weak spot and i think by the age of the third crusade it's just entirely different i mean there's nur ad-din i'll let you talk in detail about nur ad-din saladin and or, it, it, anything you want to on that um sure but they were they were just yeah it's just it's just a whole different kettle of fish really um you know uh, uh people always say that in the pre-modern world things move much more slowly than they do in our our sort of post-industrial post-modern modern, modern mm -hmm. world <laughs> but nevertheless 70 80 90 odd years is still a fair chunk of time you know yeah the, uh, especially when people don't didn't live as long back then there's actually mm. quite a few generations crammed right. into that 70 year period good point no very good point and like the style of warfare the style of armor and swords uh, was different um yeah the way people looked at the world it's a very good point actually you just made there very good it's more like it's a good sort of three generations whereas us it's sort of one and a bit <laughs> but for them yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah there won't be it, it's sort of outside living memory 80 odd years you know mm. there's sort of a whole new tranche of people I think that's fair to say. Yeah, definitely. So I, I think <clears throat> to go back to what you were saying about the romanticism of the Third Crusade, um, I, I'll brush over. I don't, I don't want to get lost too much in the weeds of setup. Um, but for the purposes of it, whereas, as we were saying before, during the First Crusade, the you know, you had the Fatimids and you had the um, the Seljuks and you, there was lots of different um, sort of Muslim factions and diasporas. What what separates the third is that they have all been brought um, under one united rule for, under the Ayyubid um, Caliphate led by uh, Salah Hadin, or as he's more obviously, uh, con um, more obviously known in uh, the West is just Saladin. Um, and what's really important is that Saladin has under his jurisdiction both Syria and Egypt. And it's this um, it's this possession of the two that really allows him to make constant war, constant war on the Crusader states, even though he has a constant um, feud with the, the Caliph of Baghdad. Um, you know, there, a lot of the Muslims at the time accuse him of the very things that we were talking about with the Crusaders back in, um, in the First Crusade. They accuse him of being really, he's not that pious. He's not really that, that Islamic. He just really wants the imperialism. He really wants the power. But at the end of the day, they can level that criticism all they want to it. But he, if he's the one constantly actually taking war to the Christians and getting results, then at what point do the two become inseparable? Yeah, I think you could say Saladin is pragmatic. Uh, he's sort of a, a great politician as well as warrior. Um, mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's that bottom line, isn't it, of uh, uh, did you win or not? Yeah. Did you win or not? That's all that really matters. You know, that's the ultimate thing about power. Um, mm. And yeah, you've got to hand it to Saladin that he never, or oh, I'm sorry, I mean, Salah Houdin. Um, you've got to <laughs> give it to him. He never, he never took his eye off the ball. Um, yeah, he's a, a great politician, I think. Yeah, fantastic. And I think what separates him from more of his, uh, well, certainly the later Muslim leaders on the Crusades, such as Berbers, is that uh, Salahuddin could be reasoned with. If if he said that he would um, do something, it, mm. you know, if he, so if he said, oh, no, I won't massacre these people, you are free to go, he would keep his word, whereas Berbers was much more duplicitous and you could never really trust his word on anything. Um, 
Although I think it's also a bit understated, sorry, a bit overstated to say that he was actually very respectful to the Crusaders. He's, he clearly saw them as a scourge that had to be purified and eradicated from the Holy Land, um, which I don't say with any sort of moral stigma. That's obviously his uh, mandate as a, as a 12th century Muslim. I wouldn't expect him to be any other way, but, you know, he wasn't he wasn't palsy as he's often more contemporarily painted out to be. So what's really important to we'll start with this. By the time of the Third Crusade, or certainly the decades leading up to it, in the 1180s, all of those obviously the First Crusade started off because essentially it was requested of the Pope by the Byzantine Emperor. By the, by, by the time of the Third Crusade, when those 90 years have come by, those good relations with the Byzantines have basically broken down. Um, there's not really a lot left. Uh, in particular, one of the real uh, dividing points is that when Andronicus I is made emperor of the Byzantines, he initiates, he's a very, very... Um, for want of a better word, xenophobic uh, emperor, and he carries out what's called the Massacre of the Latins. Um, so the, the, the Latin minorities who've migrated to Byzantium from Western Europe are, are, are basically massacred. Um, mm. And so there's not really any chance of the Byzantine Empire and the Franks working together on this crusade. It, it very much is entirely a, a Western um crusade at this point um if you have anything to to add to that yeah i suppose for me well not specifically on that but for me i think it's worth pointing out that mm. uh, well we're looking at um richard the lionheart and and so again where we talked about in the first crusade where quite often it will be the second sons or people that aren't necessarily full-blown kings will go on crusade it is a bit different now uh however a lot of people forget that richard the lionheart had an older brother henry henry the young mm. king so yes henry it, henry the second henry plantagenet richard the lionheart's father had <clears throat> four sons so there was henry the young king a, a crown prince he was crowned in his own lifetime then richard mm. the lionheart then a Jeffrey, then John, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. And and um, so Richard had really been raised or groomed to 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 be a, a second son, not to inherit. Um, and so mm. I I think that that's really fairly important to sort of Richard's psychology, or uh, and and of course all that plays out in the Third Crusade because it's kind of. Philip, uh, Philip Augustus and Richard the Lionheart's expedition, really. They're the, like, easily the two biggest players on it, aren't they? Um, yes, for sure. Should we, and, should we talk a little bit about Richard then before yeah, we please do, let's, please let's please. address the players and then we'll get into where they all go on the map. So Rick, Richard is obviously, as you've laid out, the, the second son of Henry II of England and Eleanor of Aquitaine who actually, mm. obviously, as you know, did participate on in the Second Crusade. She went there, mm. Mm. Uh, uh, you know, with her first marriage um, mm. to, mm. I, I can't remember the king that she was married to, but it was obviously, it was Louis. a king of France. Louis VII, I think? Yeah, there's been a few, haven't there? Uh, yeah, so I think it was a Louis. Uh, it probably was a seventh. You've probably got this better than I do. Um, and, and he was, Richard was definitely a mummy's boy um his mum was very he was her favorite he was easily her favorite son she was very possessive of him and he spent far more time with with eleanor than he did with with his father henry who he was obviously constantly rebelling against and um but it was actually all of these rebellions on richard's part that would obviously harden him into being the the warrior that he would need to be when it came to the time of the Crusades. But, you know, supposedly he was he was obviously strong. He was apparently six foot four. 
Um, I don't know how to obviously validate the historicity of that, but that's what I've read. Um, red hair like his father. And in every way, as we were saying, just the, the archetypal crusader, just exactly what you'd require of a man going to the Holy Land to be. But also famously with that, that infamous Angevin temper as well that his father possessed. Yeah, no, definitely. And just physically strong and brave and prepared to just uh, get involved in uh, sword play. Um, mm. There's there's a, quite, quite a few anecdotes or examples of where he, he will just charge straight into a, a wall of, of knights or, um, mm. or, or they, you mentioned um, um, uh, who's the greatest knight of the age? Um, William Marshall. Marshall, yeah, the, the Marshall. Uh, uh, the Marshall bested him in one-on-one -on -one combat. But other than that, I think there's very mm -hmm. few, if any, examples where uh, Richard was sort of bested in one-on-one -on -one combat. And so, um, yeah, he's sort of, uh, in a way, the perfect knight. Loads of, loads of accounts say that he was, he was sort of the perfect knight. And uh, or, or the story where he gets the, story, the name of the, the Lionhearted is that it's almost certainly fiction. But at one point he was um, imprisoned somewhere and uh, or, or was being held captive somewhere, being held mm. hostage. And um, a lion had been sent to kill him, to eat him. And he, uh, he, he reached down its mouth and pulled its heart out. Right. I mean, it's probably, it's almost certainly not true, is it? But um, there you go. It, it probably um, isn't, it but I'm going to choose to believe it. I'm going to choose to believe it. <laughs> They say things like he was armed only with silk and handkerchiefs. Again, mm. don't know why. Doesn't really make sense. But it's a classic no. sort of 11th, 12th century story, isn't it? Yes. Yes, absolutely. And so obviously uh, when, um, the, uh, when the Third Crusade is called by um, Gregory, Pope Gregory VIII, um, Richard is not king yet. Henry II is still alive. Um, although obviously uh, Henry, the young prince, has passed away by this point. So Rick, Richard is next in line um, to the throne. Um, but obviously he and his father had a very, very fraught uh, relationship with one another. And apparently on Henry II's deathbed, um, Richard is very remorseful for the rebellions and uprisings he has led against his father. And um, Henry refuses to forgive him for mm. for them. He um, he scorns him. He spurns him. Um, it's sort of his last act of revenge, as it were. That no, I'm not going to let you live with the peace of thinking I forgive you um, for this, which will obviously, I, I can imagine, would play on your psyche an awful lot. You would, you know, to to feel that guilt and then not have had um, absolution for it uh, from the only person who can give you it probably weighs very heavily on your conscience. Yeah, there's a story where uh, Henry II commissioned some sort of painting or tapestry uh, that showed four eaglets um, hmm. sort of devouring the, 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 the parent eagle. And mm. he's supposed to have said, yeah, those are, th that's a direct allegory. It's a direct metaphor for me and my sons who are going to pursue me until death. Um, mm. and yeah, I don't know if you've seen the film um, Lion in Winter. Um, you know what? I was meaning to watch it in preparation oh, for this, and I just didn't get time, but I'm going to watch it tonight after we've done this. It's absolutely superb. Uh, the, the old 60s or 70s version with Peter O'Toole in it and mm. um, Anthony Hopkins. I think they remade it. Well, they did remake make it not too long ago. That's crap. Oh. Don't bother with that. But the original <laughs> one... The original yeah. one from, I think, the late 60s or early 70s uh, that is truly, truly superb. And anyway, it gives you a really, really good insight into, of course, it's a, a, a play originally and then a screenplay. Mm. And of course, it's fictionalized. However, it gives you a very good insight into the dynamic in that family and how they were all scheming with and against each other kind of at all times. Mm. Um, and and but how uh, finally at the end of Henry II's life, uh, even John, his favourite, the youngest, even John was sort of 
turned against him. And um, mm. in the real histories, we are told that once Henry II was told or, or saw that on the list of conspirators against him was even John, that he sort mm. of quite physically gave up the ghost and died. Um, so it's very sad. Yeah. And I think yeah. the Cœur de Leon himself never got over. Yeah. Was sort of wrapped with guilt on some level about that for the rest of his days. Yes, for sure. So uh, that's Richard. So Philip II, mm -hmm. uh, Augustus, is regarded, I think, certainly by the French, even if that that is if they remember that they ever had any before the Republic, um, is regarded as one of the greatest French medieval kings. Um, I think in, a part of that is actually for certainly after the Crusades and not before, because um, what will become apparent throughout the storytelling is that he was constantly playing second fiddle uh, to Richard throughout a lot of this, and that really, really irked him. Uh, so that obviously quite insecure about many of those things, but clever. He was clever and he was wily and he was calculating. Um, and he knew how to, he certainly knew how to push his own agenda forward. So I, I think in the same similar way to pa uh, Salah Hadin, he, uh, well, sorry, Salah Hadin was a great warrior, but Rich uh, Philip wasn't a partic particularly strong warrior, but he was a very shrewd politician. Uh, I think it is fair to say. Yeah, no, definitely. He's got a reputation for being uh, savvy, should we say, uh, being calculating. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, being a, a very good politician in the sort of the modern sense. It's an, an anachronism to call these people politicians, but you, nevertheless, people understand what you mean. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that he he uh, was no fool. Let's put it that way. That he would, mm -hmm. he was a schemer. He very very rarely lost, <laughs> if you like. He he played mm -hmm. games within games, however you want to say it. Um, yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, n nobody's fault was old uh, Philip Augustus for sure. Yes. And then, so we'll, we'll bring him into it um, <clears throat> back again in a little while. And then, obviously, the third big player of the the Frankish armies is. Um, and um, feel free to give a bit more on this because you probably know a bit more about him than I do. But Emperor Frederick the First Barbarossa, um, who was a veteran of the second crusade and he was holy roman emperor he controlled uh, enormous amounts of land mostly um pertaining around modern day germany even down to the um the sort of italian alps wasn't he he went it went right down to the to that southern coastline um sort of near the balkans if i'm right in thinking yeah, no, Barbarossa, again, is a sort of a giant figure. Um, if you're German or, or, or Germanic, almost, in any way, mm. it doesn't have to be out and out German, if you're sort of Austrian and all that all that part of, sort of Central Europe. Barbarossa is, yeah, one of the titans of, of history. Yeah, and he's sort of known, I suppose, the first thing to know or the, the takeaway thing for him is that he is a great fighter. If, if, yeah. if um, uh, Richard is and uh, Philip II isn't, well, Barbarossa, again, is. Um, mm. He's known as one of those uh, sort of, uh, you know, very personally brave and uh, physically good at, uh, at sword play and things, um, prepared to get stuck in at a moment's notice. Um, and But by this point, he's, a, he's older, isn't he? He's easily the oldest. Both Philip and Richard, particularly Philip, are quite young, relatively young anyway. Whereas Barbarossa is oh, yeah. an old hand, isn't he? He's an old hand. Um, and uh, but yeah, as Holy Roman Emperor, hmm. again, if we look, if you see a map, I'll put a map up and things. Um, giant, giant swathes of, of, of Europe he controls. Um, arguably, and there is an argument to be made, but the most powerful man in Europe. I mean, you could say Richard, or well, before him, his father, Henry II was uh, arguably the most powerful man in Europe, certainly Western Europe. The Argevin Empire was at its absolute height there. People say from, from the Arctic Ocean to the Pyrenees, it stretched mm. it's a, a little bit of an exaggeration, but not really. I mean, um, yeah, the, the, the two most powerful people in Europe, Barbarossa and Richard, were both much more powerful, had much more resources uh, than Philip. Um, so that's, that's worth pointing out, the dynamic of that. 
Yeah, for sure. And so, um, and then obviously we've, um, so yes, and then Saladin has, as I say, he's Sultan of Egypt and Syria. Uh, there are still the Seljuks, Seljuks to, to the north, sort of on the, the Byzantine flank. And so um, I don't, I, actually, I was meaning to ask you about this, um, what, knowing that we were going to be doing this. So the historicity of the prophecy uh, of Barbarossa, that he would die at water, are, are you familiar with this or is yeah, this... Yeah. 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 Do do we know if this is something that has been sort of made up after the fact to create some deep irony or if it to what extent do we know, you know, not to get into spoilers, but mm. how 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 much do we know about the the prophecy of him dying in water? Yeah. Oh, okay, so what I'll say about that is I don't know. Um mm. so what I'm about to say if anyone really really knows their stuff, uh, might say I'm wrong. But I don't know for sure, but I think, I think, because I know a little bit about it, I've heard about it and all that sort of thing. It sounds mm. to me, just my my uh, historian's sort of spidey sense tingling, mm. it sounds like mm. it was made up after the fact. It, yeah, you know, I think that's so what, too. You know, when you just have a feeling, but I don't know, someone out there might say, well, you know, Bo's just absolutely wrong about that. Here, here's the account and here, here's when it was written and it's, it's all been verified. But to me, it does smack of... Um, it's something uh, made up after the fact, doesn't it? Don't don't you think? I, I think so too. I think it sounds a little too neat and tidy to be true. Um, and so, but what is important to note within all of this is that Barbarossa takes an alternative route to the Holy Land. Um, obviously, the generic route is that you go to where the men speak Italian and then you sail from uh, from Venice or Genoa and you, you board the ships, and then from there you go to the, the Holy Land by sea down the Mediterranean. But Barbarossa takes the, uh, takes the land route through, through the Balkans and then d across the, uh, the Bosphorus and um, into, into modern-day Turkey. So, and he gets there, he, start, he starts his campaign before Philip and Richard. Philip and Richard start by going together, but Barbarossa goes out on his own. Um, and so, shall we talk about Barbarossa's expedition first, and then we'll then we'll take Richard and Philip's uh, lead into it. Yeah. Okay. So Barbarossa uh, takes his army, which um, obviously historical sources um, differ on this. I've heard different things, but I've the number that I've found most common is about 20,000 soldiers. That's what he takes with him. He takes about 20,000 soldiers uh, through to Constantinople. And from there is obviously very quickly let through so he can just be on his way and uh, start, starts taking the war to, to the Seljuks. And uh, as you would expect from a man of his uh, military pedigree, uh, enormously effective. Uh, he obviously goes through some, some bloody confrontations, but essentially he gets to the, he doesn't, he doesn't even make it out of the, the Eastern half of Turkey, does he? The river, Salaf River. And essentially before he even gets to Otrima, and the, the Crusader states, he's by the river in his heavy armor, and his a, a lot of the horses, including the one that he's on, um, just spooks. His horse spooks, and he falls into the river. Um, and the river is actually only uh, knee high. It's only a knee high river. It's not that deep, but because he's in his heavy armor. He starts panicking and he can't get himself up. And I think they drag him out of the water. But whilst he's been in there panicking, he, he has a heart attack um, and and he dies. Uh, really, uh, really unfortunate and unromantic end to, you know, to one of the great generals of, of medieval Europe. 
Yeah, it's a really ignominious end for him, isn't it? And it's one of those yes. deaths. Uh, it happens all the time in history where you, you kind of expect someone to have a better death than that. You know, mm. the thing that springs to my mind whenever I ruminate on Barbarossa is, is Alexander. Alexander mm. the Great did all these things and then just had sort of, well, we don't even know exactly, but some sort of drinking fit, a, a drinking surfeit, or just sort of got a bit ill or maybe a, a, a combination of those things. And anyway, just sort of petered out and died. And it's like, well, you, you would you, you would like something a bit a bit more spectacular than that. And with Barbarossa, it's the same. It's um, but that's what happens, isn't it? Quite often, I mean, in in real life, I mean, that's what real life is like. Um, suddenly, death just comes for you, and it can be it can be very ignominious. It can be very uh, low key. Um, it can be completely out of the blue. It can be completely against the run of play in your life so to speak so you would you would hope that someone like barbarossa um would have uh, would have been something a bit more glorious than that but um but there you go that's real life for you isn't it yeah and and consequently as a um as a um sorry as a consequence of his death uh, his army breaks down um i think from the 20,000 that he takes with him, only about 5,000 of those German Germanic warriors actually make it to the Holy Land to carry on the crusade. So that's an enormous factor. Um, I mean, you, you've basically lost about 15,000 men there that have just turned around and gone home or just sort of spread out into various places where they're not really going to be much good to anyone. Uh, so yeah, just really... It's very strange that you've got all of these. I mean, these are the big name celebrities of the Crusades. You know, you've got Barbarossa, you've got Philip II, and you've got Richard. And you'd think with an absolute bunch of A tier, you know, Philip's maybe not A tier, but, you know, with such high caliber uh, kings and generals, it'd be impossible to, to lose. You, you know, yeah, the Crusades have never been more well-backed, more well-governed than this. And just through a combination of bad luck and, and misfortune, a lot of things in the Third Crusade just don't work out as well as they possibly could have done. Uh, there's a lot of what-ifs with the Third Crusade. A lot of what-ifs. Um, so just to mention, the... Uh, layout of the Third Crusades and what the what the Western Crusaders are walking into here. By the time of 1189, when Barbarossa has started making his way across and Philip and Richard are preparing, those Crusader states that had been set up at the end of the First Crusade are basically gone. There's there's nothing left. Salahuddin has basically conquered absolutely all of it. Um, it's really, I don't think it can be understated just how much the Crusades hang by an absolute thread by this point. The only city that the Crusaders still have left is Tyre, um, which is a port city um, on the northern, uh, I'm sure you'll have a map as well, um, the northern point of their their old kingdoms and if Tyre goes that's it they've nowhere to land they've nowhere to put their troops out um and so it's quite a bit miraculous really that Tyre was able to hold on long enough for the cruise third crusade to happen yeah no absolutely and uh I mean Tyre is fantastically ancient isn't it we've mentioned Alexander a minute ago Alexander besieged Tyre famously extremely difficult to attack again very very easy to defend it's only really mm. attached to land. well nowadays it's attached to land via um sort of a causeway originally or in Alex alexander's day it was fully an island um, but anyway the point is is that it's very sort of easily defensible so no wonder it's sort of one of the last one of the last hangouts for the crusader kingdoms um mm. and so yeah i mean you can att uh, attempt some sort of amphibious assault on somewhere like Jaffa or something, but yeah, uh, they they were they. You're absolutely right to to, to describe it as uh, sort of hanging on by their fingernails. Um, yeah, absolutely. And on their way down, doesn't Richard 
uh, get involved in Malta. Is it Malta or Cyprus or both? Um, I can't remember. Oh, I jog my memory. Well, Cy Cyprus for sure. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I just, um, yeah, okay. I was going to, um, I actually have here uh, a book by the travels of Ibn Jubayr, um, who was a, a Spanish Muslim Moor who lived at the time. And it's basically just his travel log as he goes around the Holy Land. So it's an incredibly primary source for where he just lays out the cities and uh, what they're like. And um, it's very good, but I'll get to that a little bit later. Yes, let's, uh, when we, when they land in Tyre, I'll, I'll bring that in. Uh, but yeah, so uh, Richard and Philip set out together um, and they both sail to Sicily along with their armies. And th they set off together because neither one trusts one another to go first. Um, they, they, they are already from the beginning, you can tell these two are just not going to play nice with one another. They don't trust one another. Uh, their kingdoms, their, their natural enemies, France wants its lost, um, lost French lands in, in Aquitaine and, and Brittany. And um, obviously Richard doesn't trust Philip to uh, just wait on the doorstep. And obviously Richard will be totally vindicated by that within a couple of years. Uh, but for now, uh, the two of them set off to Sicily together. And in order to create some level of trust between each other, uh, Philip proposes that Richard marries his sister. Uh, and uh, Richard spurns this. Uh, Richard uh, doesn't go along with it. Um, I've not been able to figure out why. Perhaps you have a little bit more knowledge on that than I do. <clears throat> yeah, he had his eye on somebody else already. Um, uh, quite often uh, in this sort of early medieval period, um, people, uh, th there were political marriages, and then and people did marry, though, for love as well. Um, mm. So uh, Richard had had his eye on somebody else, and he actually got Eleanor of Aquitaine to bring her out. He's got his mum, who's like in her 70s by this point, I think, to bring mm. her out, this girl he loved. And she was like fairly well born. She wasn't a nobody. Um, and anyway, he wanted to marry her just for, for actual love, courtly love reasons. And so even that would have been a good political marriage to marry into the... The, the the house of the Capes. Uh, he just mm. didn't want to do that. And so he thought, oh, well, you know, it's a political marriage anyway. I'll just give Philip loads of money and it will all be, everyone will be cool. Well, they mm. weren't. <laughs> he did give no. them loads of money, uh, but but uh, Philip Augustus saw that as a, a real slight and uh, yes. n never really forgave him. Uh, Berengaria, I think, of That's Navarre is That's the, right. the, yeah. the lady yeah. he thought marrying. Uh, although they didn't f famously, they they didn't actually end up spending a lot of time with one another. Um, so, you know, you can ask again. It's that thing. What if? What if Richard had, in fact, married Philip's sister as Philip had had asked him to? Would things have turned out different or or better? We'll we'll never know. But anyway, he marries uh, Berengaria, and Philip by this point sets off on his own with his army. Uh, for the Holy Land, and Richard follows after. Uh, Philip has the fortune of good weather, um, which cannot be understated. So he gets to the Holy Land. I think he sails off in March 1191, and he's there by the end of April. Um, <clears throat> however, F uh, Richard's uh, fleet is caught in a, a tremendous storm. And in the process of this, Berencaria... Uh, his newly wedded wife and his sister and his treasury, uh, his royal coffers for, for the crusade, are all blown off course and a base, basically land on Cyprus. And this creates one of the most amusing little detours that I've possibly ever seen, um, where Richard gets to demonstrate his capabilities as a commander. So Cyprus is nominally under the jurisdiction of the Byzantine Empire. Uh, however, it has been recently taken over 
by a petty tyrant called Isaac, um, just looking at the notes, Komnenos, um, who has uh, set himself upon Cyprus as his own little emperor of Cyprus. And Richard comes to the island and says, you know, return my my wife and my sister and and my treasury to me and we'll we'll be on our way and um a bit devoid in uh, the use of logic um isaac decides that well i'm an emperor and you're just a king so you've got no chance of beating me uh there's nothing you can do and uh yeah that doesn't really go very well for him because uh richard ends up taking the entire island of Cyprus uh, just just with his army. Uh, even though they're uh, numerically inferior, he famously just starts the siege and just says to his men, follow me. And they do. And uh, it goes quite swimmingly for them. Yeah. He, Richard is one of those leaders of men who just inspires confidence in sort of the martial sense. Um, um, obviously, his own death is a, is an, a, an exception. But whatever he touches turns to gold. He's got sort of that Midas touch quite often. Like mm -hmm. he can he can lead ten, twenty, fifty knights somewhere, and they'll just succeed. <laughs> you know, yeah. some of those people in history, a bit like Alexander again, really. Just almost whatever he tries works. It seems he, he's yeah. just got um, yeah, he's just, it, it, and it's not really luck. You can't keep doing that and say it's lucky. Um, he just seems to be able to lead men very well. And yeah, Cyprus is sort of, it's almost like a footnote, isn't it? It's almost like, oh, and then he invaded Cyprus real quick, successfully, the whole of Cyprus. It's almost like yeah. that, isn't it? Um, so, um, yeah. yeah. It's just and then it just took Cyprus. Martial prowess. Yeah. yeah. So, but that actually, <clears throat> uh, even though it's a footnote militarily, Cyprus obviously, is, as you know, becomes incredibly important. Yes, uh, within the, it's in, key, yeah. Yeah, within the future. It's obviously a, a wonderfully positioned island for uh, the Christians to regroup, to set up a headquarters and to launch further invasions into the Holy Land. Uh, but for, for the purposes of now, uh, Richard sets um, his headquarters up on Limassol Castle. Um, uh, chronologically, I'm not quite sure how to do how you want to do this. So the thing is, obviously, you've got different players around completely different parts of the map. So do you want to, shall we stay with Richard and do his part? Um, yeah. yeah, okay. So he, um, some ships uh, come to Cyprus, uh, Christian ships, whole, um, with, led by Guy de Lusignan. Mm -hmm. And Guy de Lusignan is the former well, I mean, he still claims to be, obviously, king of Jerusalem, but let's just say he's the king of Jerusalem without Jerusalem. It's under him that Jerusalem was lost uh, to Saladin's armies. He was beaten at the Battle of Hattin absolutely roundly, no questions asked. And then uh, Saladin, um, again, to go back to what you were saying about Saladin's shrewdness as a politician, he just lets Guy go. Uh, because he knows having Guy out there is a great way to create political division amongst the Crusaders, um, because he's just one more um, entitled, uh, power-wanting uh, Crusader who will put his own claim forth for the Kingdom of Jerusalem against other people, so he just knows that he's um, going to be a great use for division. And Guy comes to Richard and basically petitions him to say, look, I was obviously the former king of Jerusalem. Please support my claim to be king of Jerusalem again once we retake the city. And Richard uh, agrees to this. Uh, Richard agrees to this. He doesn't find Guy a particular comp particularly competent person, but he knows that he is Guy's best shot at getting Guy what he wants, and therefore Guy won't betray him because he knows that because Richard knows that he is the key to getting Guy what he wants. So he trusts him, even though he doesn't find him particularly competent. 
Yeah, and Guy Delusion was a key player in all this, and he is also a great warrior in his own right. Um, mm-hmm. But as you say, not uh, not sort of an incredible politician, again, to use that word. Um, in fact, Richard isn't. Um, Sir Charles Oman, historian, says mm. that Richard was like a, a child politically. Yeah, that, mm. that's, I think he actually uses those words. He says he's like, yeah, he's this great knight. He's, and he's very, very, uh, he's actually very loyal. He, re- he rewards people that were loyal to his father, even that were against him during those, mm. those wars. So he takes oaths very seriously and he's very loyal. And he's a great fighter. Da, 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 da. But when it comes to sort of making political machinations, when it comes to sort of diplomacy, he's a child. And Guy de Lusignan isn't much better, it's, it seems. Um, they're not so sort of, well, they're outclassed by Saladin politically. Just outclassed. Totally. Both of them. Totally. Um, yeah. So, yeah, that's, yes. that's a key thing to say, I think. Mm. No, absolutely true. Absolutely true. Um, and so, and at this point, Richard uh, and Guy both start sailing towards the Holy Land. So now that they're on the way, let's pick back up with Philip. Philip arrives at, um, I believe he arrives at Acre uh, about three days after Acre has been, oh, no, am I thinking of, I think I might be thinking of Conrad. I'm thinking of Conrad of Montferrat. So Conrad has come from the West as well. Uh, Conrad's father, William, is already, uh, I think he's already Lord of Tyre. Is he not? Uh, so his he, his family have already landed uh, stakes within the Holy Land, and Conrad is an in, immensely important player in all of this because Conrad of Montferrat is the man who Philip II of France backs to be king of Jerusalem once they take the city. And so already you can see here, a bit like what you were saying with the First Crusade, you've got the factional infighting. They're all, the kings have their own men that they're putting into position and their own um, their own councils. And they, there's very little transparency between the two of them. They don't really share anything. It's almost, it is like having two almost separate armies that just mm. sometimes will work together on a common purpose, but otherwise absolutely despise one another. There's very little unity in the the early stages of the, the Third Crusade. Yeah, no, it's a fair point. No, yeah, absolutely fair point. And uh, anyone who knows the story without, you know, any spoilers a lot or jumping ahead, you know, that is, that is one of the most important things about it, really, is that mm. they were never able to all truly pull together in, in, in the same direction mm. yes so uh so conrad arrives at tyre and again as i was saying earlier tyre is the the last holdout of the crusaders if they lose this they lose the entire coastline they lose all the lands that they've they've gained so um i'd just like to read a little bit from ibn jubayer here who talks about the the city uh when he was there so he says This city has become proverbial for its impregnability, and he who seeks to conquer it will meet with no surrender or humility. The Franks prepared it as a refuge in case of unforeseen emergency, making it a strong point for their safety. Its roads and streets are cleaner than those of Acre. Its people are by disposition less stubborn in their unbelief, and by nature and habit, they are kinder to the Muslim strangers. Their manners, in other words, are gentler. So he, yeah, Tyre is seen as a, a certainly one of the more pious places. It's full of more serious men. By by comparison, I, I won't read the quote, but um, Jubayer describes Acre as a bit of a cesspit of degeneracy. And, you know, it's like the Brighton of, uh, of the Holy Land, really. Um, so, oh, sorry, you were going to say something. No, no, it's just a very quick point, just to say that, um, mm. Yeah, uh, Acre had this reputation for being not all that nice. Uh, but Tyre, I mentioned it already, actually. It's sort of fantastically ancient. It's sort of the mother city of uh, 
Carthage, where the, sort of the Phoenicians uh, hmm. uh, are from. So it was already it was already steeped by the time of Alexander in the 300s, in the 330s BC. Hmm. That's that sort of how old Tyre is. You know, it's sort of, it's, it's truly ancient. You know, it's up there with Babylon and stuff. So yeah, just wanted to mention that. No, fantastic. And so the uh, but Conrad arrives at Tyre and he just immediately becomes an enormously capable leader. Um, he takes over the defense of the city and Salahuddin and his army are ready to take it as the last the last piece on the chessboard uh, for, for complete victory. And Salahuddin uh, leads, has captured Conrad's father, William, and basically does the old, you know, surrender the city or I'll kill your father. And Conrad's quoted as saying, tie him to a stake, what do I care? I shall be the first to shoot him, for he is old and worthless. <laughs> um, that's some balls, that, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, Saladin was reported to have been very impressed, actually, by that, um, by that willingness to fight on and not be sentimentally tied to just his relative, to, to, to see the bigger picture. Um, at work here. And so Saladin abandons the siege, but he comes back later that year uh, with a second siege. And this time he brings the Egyptian fleet uh, with him and he surrounds Tyre with, um, on both sides with, with the Egyptian fleet to cut off their, uh, well, any obviously to blockade it, to cut off any supplies that they might get from the sea. And Conrad manages to create a plan under the cover of darkness to send out a night raid in some ships. And the Egyptian uh, seafarers are completely caught off by surprise. And Conrad, again, manages to break the second siege. Um, he, he's a very, very competent general. That's certainly the, the impression that I got of him. Yeah, and as I said, Tyre is sort of famously... Uh, e easy to defend. Uh, was, mm. I think it was even long before Alexander, one of, like King Nebuchadnezzar or someone like that, deep, mm. deep in uh, long ago. <laughs> yeah, um, tried to besiege Tyre and like tried for like ten years or or, or, or twenty years or something stupid and failed mm. and in the end failed. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's not an easy spot on the map to to take. No. Um, so south of Tyre is, as we previously mentioned, Acre. And Acre is the first enormous uh, battle of the Third Crusade, the Siege of Acre, that goes on from 89 to 91. Um, it's a really, really long siege. Um, and it's the one where sort of all the key players converge together. Um, so I'd love your input on this one as well. Um, I can't quite remember who starts the siege. It's does Conrad take his army down? No, Guy. Guy takes his army down, doesn't he, and starts laying siege to to Acre. Um, and Salahuddin's forces come to relieve the city from from the east. And essentially, what happens is something very su similar to Julius Caesar's. Um, conquest of Alessa, that there is a double wall mm. created. And so the Crusaders have got a war on both fronts. They're sieging Acre on one side and they're keeping out Saladin's forces on the other. Uh, absolute madness. Uh, but it works. It's it's a really effective defence. Yeah, there's a few examples of that in history. Um, yeah, Julius Caesar, uh, uh, Alicia, or is it Elysium or whatever? Uh, yeah, that, that's sort of one of the mo most famous examples. But um, there's a fair few examples of it happening in history, and this is one. Um, and it just goes to show, it, it just goes to show that man for man, Western knights, or, or, or sort of, uh, <laughs> sometimes even um, they would they would still call them Celts, I suppose, because they're people like people like uh, Richard himself is sort of very white, <laughs> red headed even. Mm. Um, yeah, man for man, they're just superior. 
um, you know, if it comes down to one on one combats and things, they're sort of physically bigger, physically stronger, mm. um, uh, and sort of uh, uh, much less likely to lose their nerve as well. Um, mm. So yeah, all those things are yeah. The siege of Acre is a it's a it's a real it's a real uh, test, isn't it? It's a real long one. Yeah, absolutely. And so at this point, um, obviously Philip arrives as well, helps shore up the defenses at Acre, and then eventually uh, Richard arrives as well uh, with his fleet. And there is a ship that they encounter. And um, just outside of Acre, an enormous ship. Um, there's some phenomenal artwork of it. Um, I don't know if you'd be able to find it for the post-production, but of um, them sieging the what what's called the Leviathan. Uh, this enormous supply ship of Saladin's with like elite troops on it and supplies to um, relieve the Muslim defenders and um, obviously to shore them up for a longer protracted siege and uh again once again as you said you know the miners touch richard just destroys it just takes it it says you know I, I don't want that ship getting away without at least being damaged you know come on um and he just goes for it and it, it works and salah hadin once that uh ship is sank uh salah hadin basically concedes that he's lost acca mm. Yeah, uh, it's funny because it's rare. It's it's fairly rare, if memory serves, that Saladin, um, like you can break his will. Like I know, I know we've already said he's sort of a pragmatist. He's a realist, hmm. um, but rarely does he sort of just give up on, on sort of big projects anyway. But there, you can see he sort of made the calculation. Oh, we really needed that to get through. Yeah, um, <laughs> we that was just that was the, a deal breaker right there. Yes. And yeah. And the will of uh, uh, Richard of, of the Coeur de Lyon is sort of sort of wins that one. He sort of wins that one, doesn't he? Yes. And so this is where um, so the Crusaders uh, eventually uh, take Acre, get within the walls. And obviously this comes to the um, and I'd, I'd, I'd absolutely love to, to have your take on this because it's obviously one of the most controversial and debated over aspects of the Third Crusade. Um, they take 2,700 Muslims prisoner. Um, obviously, it's very, very infamous that this uh, there's a constant negotiation between Richard and Salah Hadin. Who, who never meet um, throughout the whole crusade. I think that's a really interesting point to, to mention, uh, but their emissaries are sent back and forth to one another to negotiate. And it's felt that uh, by Richard that Salah Hadin is just stalling for time. And so Richard has all, all of them, all, almost 3000 of them uh, beheaded and executed. Um, so I, I just really like your thoughts on that. Yeah, it's often said as like this is some sort of terrible, like unbelievable, unprecedented war crime. Well, it's not. No, it's not at all. <laughs> There's loads and loads of examples of uh, all throughout all of history where stuff like that happened. Yeah, it's pretty dirty. Yeah, mm. it's pretty brutal. But it's also part of the course. It's like it's one of those things in history in like the 20th century revisionist historians who want to sort of uh, cast shadow over the west over the western tradition over any of our western heroes find something like that and just make a big deal out of it mm. like oh the, the english the english speaking peoples hold richard the lionheart in high high esteem let's find something bad and gross that he did and make a big deal out of it that's what i think that is there's it, mm. if, yes it's very brutal but it's nothing special about it at all. That's no, what happened. No, I totally they, agree. They were having uh, Richard and Saladin were. Um, yeah, it's interesting. They never met. Like um, Elizabeth and Mary Queen of Scots never met. However, mm -hmm. they had lots of uh, emissaries back and forth. They were in quite close um, communication with each other, and they were trying to, to figure out uh, uh, some sort of prisoner exchange or whatever, some sort of deal. And Saladin just pushed it to the point where Richard sort of had no option. Um, mm. Well, not that he had no option. Of course he had an option, but that was just what would happen now. 
And so, yeah, he executes them all. But no, it's like it's it's not it's not really anything special in the grand scheme of of history at all. No, That's and nice. obviously, as a, as a consequence of it, um, Salah Hadin does the same in turn and massacres all of the Christian uh, yeah. prisoners on, under his possession. Right. Um, they do like for like, um, yeah. and so, uh, so to move on from this, I think this is a point where we should point point uh, bleh, words. We should point out Philip leaves the King yeah. of France. Philip II yeah. leaves. Um, he his um, heart is clearly not in it. Um, he's felt like he's been playing second fiddle to Richard ever since Richard arrives. Richard commands the respect, and he commands. Um, well, again and again, he's just um, he's obviously feeling incredibly spurned uh, by Richard for uh, refusing his sister, and he wants to go home. And so he does. He leaves on five ships, uh, two of them of which are Richard's ships. Richard literally lends him two ships uh, to help him take himself home. And Richard makes him swear a vow that whilst he's home, he won't attack any of Richard's lands. Um, Philip clearly crossed his fingers behind his back as he swore it, right? Yeah. Because, well, so they, now you're seeing we've got the sort of grand sort of um, geopolitical thing involved. Philip Augustus realises, uh, well, you can only imagine it's part of his calculation that if I go back, um, you know, everything's in my favour. The, the mm. great Coeur de Lyon just simply isn't there. And, you know, the Angevin Empire, Richard still controls, he's, he's Duke of Normandy, um, he's Count of Anjou, uh, him or his family at least control uh, the Aquitaine you know vast vast swathes of France are controlled by him so if Philip can go back to France and um, he can start it's just going to be a lot lot easier for him to uh, make his position in France better if Richard isn't there now mm. historians and scholars have talked a lot about argued about how much was that playing it we don't know exactly how much was that playing into Philip's decision to leave was it simply mm. that he we had enough of the Holy Land and felt spurned and all that sort of thing or was it was it simply that he calculated Richard's not going to leave and if I do well back home is going to be great for me and I can make some sort of uh, uh, agreement with John uh, Prince John King John in England mm. and we can work together to destroy Richard's position so we don't know for sure the exact dynamic of all of that, but it certainly played into it. And and as we've already said, Philip is no fool. He's 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 no. almost certainly making calculated, very sort of highly calculated decisions on all of this stuff. But what we do know for sure is that yeah, he leaves. <laughs> he makes a decision. He's just going to leave. He's just going to abandon the Third Crusade essentially. Mm. And history and some of his own men at the time, lots of his own men, you know, criticise him heavily for that. It's like, wait, so it was all it was all bullshit, was it, from the beginning? The whole thing mm. was just a ploy, was it? The whole thing was a some sort of political gambit, was it, or not? I mean, it seems to me, in my opinion, if you want my personal opinion, and it's just mm, that, I do. you know, um, is that uh, Philip would have been uh, genuinely, legitimately up for the crusade, at, but at some point, at some point along the line, it must have crept into his thinking, ah, Richard is too entangled in this, too invested in this. If I do go home, yeah, I'm going to take some flack. You know, history and a lot of my men are going to criticise me for being a coward or something, for essentially running away. But, mm. but ah, the political pragmatism. If I do do that, and if I'm prepared to take the flack for it, I'm actually, in the long run, I'm, you know, it's going to be good for me back home. And and it is, you know, it is. That's not that's yeah. Not a, that calculation was correct. So yes, yes, um, yeah. He's not clutching at nothing, thing. is he? It was a, it was a, a savvy move mm -hmm. um, on his mm -hmm. part. You know, he he acted in his own self interest, and uh, it paid off for him. Maybe mm -hmm. not on a reputational level, but certainly on a material level. Mm, exactly. Um, at the time, um, yeah. So 
Uh, but for, nominally, from that point on, it is Richard's crusade. There, there is no other. And, and what's really important, I think, at this point as well, that this is the most involved that a king of England, sorry, that basically England has ever been in the Crusades up to this point. Mm. Um, you know, this, this really is, if, if England had a Crusade, it was a third. Mm. We're never more involved as, as a nation and as a people than we are in this one. Um, so I think that's just worth, worth pointing out for the sake of our own history here. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, so, uh, Richard uh, has the fortifications of Acre uh, rebuilt and revitalized, and he has a trade um, set up to start coming back in, and Acre's um, quite well restored. This is one of the, the things that's uh, noticeable with the Frankish, that invariably they, they will stop a lot on the way and renovate places to, to bolster them and fortify them. Uh, so that they can, because obviously, you know, as we have to remember, they're literally taking back everything that was lost from them. Uh, and if they don't refortify, then it will just get taken away again straight away. Um, so it takes a lot of time. Uh, but uh, I think Richard is, again, I think militarily he's right to do it. It's cautious, it's savvy. And um, it will serve the Crusader states better in the long run, for sure. Yeah, and when we talked about in the First Crusade, when the uh, <clears throat> when the First Crusaders get to Jerusalem in 1099, um, they they just as as I've described it very in a very low resolution way, they need to do some sort of uh, hail Mary attempt to get inside. Uh, well, you know the world's moved on again since then richard that, that's not really an option for richard uh mm. doing something like that because saladin's war machine if you like is so much bigger and more sophisticated than the uh the fatimids had back in 1099 it's a whole different mm. richard's facing a whole different enemy whole different one so yeah he can't oh, yeah. just try this sort of long shot it, you know as you say you, you need to fort along the way you need sort of solid supply and logistic lines you can't just go out deep into enemy territory and as long as you take a city a walled city then you'll be okay you've then got a sort of an island base it's sort of an inland island base that you can then work from it it's mm. not like that anymore so no. so yeah richard's richard's job is logistically completely different to the first crusade and a, a lot more difficult to be fair yeah, it's it's such um <clears throat> it really is an incredible uphill battle. So the the problem that Richard faces that obviously Jerusalem is a fair bit in land. It's quite in land, mm. and so he needs to start um, recapturing the the port cities so that he can get um, the resources and the manpower behind him to to so so that if and when. He takes Jerusalem. It's not, as you said, just a, an, an island in, in the land um, that it has roots to, to back it up and fortify it so that they're not just taken from all sides where uh, they're basically, as soon as they take it, they're going to lose it again. It needs to have, have permanence to hit. And so Richard decides to march down to with his army towards Jaffa, um, down the uh, southern coast, quite near to Asalon, which is sort of the uh, the hinge point for Salah Hadin's. Um, it's a city that's sort of the hinge point for his uh, Syria, Egypt um, duopoly, uh, for want of a better way to put it. So Richard's men, he gets them in formation. He keeps very close to the coastline and he makes sure that he's, he's very cautious about it. He makes sure that they're well rested. He makes sure that they're getting plenty of water because obviously of the, the searing heat and wearing a full suit of metal. Uh, I can't even begin to imagine how horrible that will be. I mean, that's just, that must be the worst form of torture. I just, I can't imagine doing that. 
Yeah, you say they march very close to the coast. I mean, very close. I think they're marching along beaches quite a lot of the time, mm. literally marching along the beach. Um, and one very quick note to say is that quite mm. often uh, you, d- you need to be quite, you need to be a full blown knight. You need to be quite wealthy really to have a full plate mail. But even normal men, even archers, quite often, <clears throat> pardon me, quite often they'd have uh, undercoats or surcoats or some sort of a uh, garment on their upper body that was made of felt. Mm. Now felt, the very thick, dense felt would quite often stop yeah. arrows. It was very good. If you had chain mail and if you had a felt jacket and then chain mail, you're quite well protected. But in the boiling hot sun uh, of the Middle East, uh, yeah, it's it's almost like a torture. Um, yeah, you, it's going to be very, very uncomfortable. Mm. And it's part of, and the thing is as well, that this is part of the reason why the Crusaders lost um, at the Battle of Hattin in 1187 before the Third Crusade uh, in generals arrived because Saladin managed to get them away from the water and basically surround them in a desert and just let them fatigue themselves until they were no longer capable of fighting and then just launched his attack. And it was like it was like cutting through paper. It was easy for him. So Saladin's very good at using the land to his advantage. And but Richard in turn doesn't fall into Saladin's traps. You know, it's that thing, isn't it? What you were saying about Richard being, you know, everything he touches just sort of turning to gold, but you can see a real intelligence for war in Richard. You can see a real fierce, lifelong experience and knowledge of how to do it. Uh, And that is going to play in, uh, in a nice little segue into probably the most famous battle of the Third Crusade, the the Battle of Arsuf, Mm -hmm. which I suppose we should come to now. Yeah, just as we quick say, Richard, yeah, he's, Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to all things war, he really is um, sort of genuinely, uh, you know, a bit of a genius. Like even when it comes down to sort of the design of castles and all that sort of thing, diplomatically, politically, yeah, he's almost childlike. But in terms of war, anything war related, uh, he, he just he just knows his stuff. It's as simple as that. He really is genuinely mm. uh, some among the best of his age. Mm. And just knows how to inspire people. Uh, just a quick little anecdote, um, and then we'll move on to Asif. Obviously, back at the uh, the Siege of Acre, which we just talked about, uh, Richard got a fever and he was ill. And obviously, it's quite a famous story, but he just got, he just, rather than sitting it out in his bed, he, he just had his uh, men put him on the royal stretcher and just carried him to and fro outside the walls of Acre, just pot-shotting them with a crossbow. And <laughs> it's like just... <laughs> You know, the most insane, you know, just refused, always refused to do nothing. You know, was Mm. always, no matter how little he could contribute, he always did something. Mm. Um, So, uh, on to Arsif. Uh, So, Arsif is a castle on the coast, and Richard is trying to get to Arsif so that he can obviously fortify. Saladin's army is descending upon him out of the uh, out from his uh, eastern flank. And so Richard moves his men as close to the coastline as he possibly can so that he's not flanked from both sides. And um, I'm hopefully you'll be able to put a map up in uh, post-production. But essentially what happens is Richard has the baggage train with all of his supplies in um, by, by the coast on you know as close to the coast as he can uh, so as to protect it then he has his ranged in infantry uh in that same row towards the front so that they uh they're most well protected by the heavy infantry then on the second row um from the coast you've got the in the vanguard you've got the uh knights templars um, led by their Grand Master Robert de Sable, and at the back you've got the Hospitallers, led by their uh, Master Garnier de Nebrus, and both are kind of important to the battle. Garnier certainly is, um, and then around them 
uh, Richard creates a, an arc of heavy infantry uh, to protect them. And as you were saying, I mean, your, your knowledge of the uh, uh, of armor and weaponry is probably a, a lot better than mine. But um, obviously, Saladin just showers them with arrows, and the heavy cavalry, um, the heavy knights, lose a lot of their horses, but very few of them die. Um, it really can't be understated. You see it all the time in cinema with with arrows just going through armor just um, killing people with one shot but if that was the case why would they wear it it's um it's incredibly resilient to arrows particularly from a long range uh yes yeah no that's absolutely true there's accounts from this where there'll be normal guys they're not even wearing plate mail they're just wearing mm. felt as i mentioned felt a particular type mm. of sort of very dense felt and maybe chain mail maybe not even chain mail normal guys Walking along with sort of ten arrows sticking out of them, none of them have pierced them. They're just stuck in the felt. Yeah, there'll be, and so the sort of the recurve bows that the uh, Muslims use quite often. A, a long range. It's not the same as a long bow. It's not the same sort of the Agincourt era English long bow. Nothing like mm. of the of the sort. So yeah, quite often these arrows, the 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 the. the, the the, the the battle between arrows and armor at this point armor is very much winning um mm -hmm. so yeah in, in fact in that march along the along the uh, coastline or along the beach yeah there'll be guys that there was there's accounts of englishmen um knights with uh, just multiple multiple arrows sticking out of them and uh, stuck in their armor and none mm -hmm. of them have pierced them so there you go that that gives you an idea it's fantastic. You're just going to you'd end up looking like a pincushion at the end yeah. of it, and yet we're still say, fighting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, Salah Hadin has on his side. He has an enormous amount. So the numbers for the battle, um, from what I've been able to uh, figure out to the best of my ability, is that Richard has about eleven thousand men um, in his army at this point. Salahuddin overwhelms him by more than a two to one ratio. Salahuddin has about 25,000 men uh, currently about to descend on Richard's army at this point. And so Salahuddin sends out his light cavalry to harass uh, the rear of Richard's army and hopes that Richard will send men from the front to the back and therefore obviously weaken it up. Um, so he's trying to create a crack in in, in Richard's well formationed army to obviously break in and overwhelm it from the inside. And essentially, what happens is that got, um, the hospitalers who are at the rear guard keep trying to send messages to Richard at the front. And uh, Garnier uh, de Nebris says to him, "We are violently pressed in by the enemy, my lord." We are in danger of eternal infamy if we do not dare to return their blows. Each of us is losing our horses. Why should we not bear this shame any... Uh, sorry, why should we bear this shame any further? We must attack, i.e. We, we must break rank. We must break the formation and start trying to push them back. And uh, Richard says back to him, Patience, good master. It is you who must resist their attacks. No one can be everywhere at once. The line must hold. And so Richard's entire strategy relies on just holding the formation and eventually wearing, uh, using, obviously, as you say, the military might of his heavy armor troops to just grind the Muslims down and wear them, wear them out. However, uh, something goes wrong uh, that Richard uh, uh, doesn't foresee. And some of the hospital knights do just start to charge of their own accord. They've had enough. They're, they're, they're tired of being harassed any longer. And they break ranks and they start trying to break through to the uh, the Muslim line, break through uh, to the Muslims. And then before you know it, more and more of the hospitalers are, are charging through. And what this reminded me of when I was researching it, it reminded me of when you and Carl were talking about the Battle of Hastings when you were saying about, you know, and then some of the uh, the Anglo-Saxons ran 
And rather than take the initiative and just go with it, you know, as Godwin Singh should have done, he holds it. And so they're able to be picked off just a little bit by a little bit. But unlike Godwinson in this situation, Richard seizes on the initiative. He just says, well, if they're running, then we're all going to go. And he just orders a full a full assault. And uh, it works. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it, how history can turn on literally one man's decision in a, in a window of a few seconds to make a decision. And that decision, mm-hmm. uh, sort of uh, all of world history, well, maybe a slight exaggeration, but European history could turn on that and does you know um almost as if there's a great man of history sometimes almost <laughs> mm. and i think that's a bit far right to say something like that as well, <laughs> well <laughs> yeah if you, no, mean far, no. if you mean far correct then yes <laughs> yeah i mean so it's a fantastic moment isn't it um mm. and uh yeah and it just goes to show that richard like uh a lot of the great generals in history, uh, in, in in the moment, makes the right call, you know, because it obviously was. It just obviously was. It's as simple as that. And yeah, yeah the, the Muslim horde is um, sort of uh, pushed back, isn't it, in that moment? Yeah. And um, Salah Hadeen's totally overwhelmed by it. Totally overwhelmed. He He basically vows never to chance a pitched battle against mm. Richard ever again. Uh, it's it's sort of the one and only pitch battle of the Crusades. Everything else, uh, conflict-wise, takes place around uh, se- besieging cities. He doesn't dare to just lead another charge at him in, in the open again. Um, so the Crusaders lose about 700 men at the Battle of Arsuf, um, one of which is actually the, the Templar Grand Master, uh, Robert de Sable. Um, who was one of Richard's lieutenants, who'd actually come over from uh, Richard's French king, uh, French territories with him. And it was Richard who had appointed him to the position of, uh, or certainly had influence in appointing him to the position of Grand Master. So you can see here as well just how much Richard holds influence over so much of what goes on in the Holy Land, apart from just being there to, to defend it and do the war he's actually doing a bit of politicking as well as he goes around and inserting his own men into the positions of power um yeah so there and Salah Hadin obviously just loses enormous swathes of his army enormous swathes so Richard um starts marching towards Jaffa um so that he can use it as a port to bolster his march towards Jerusalem, but Salah Hadin has it um, that An Asalon just raised. He just has them raised to the ground, um, so that Richard has to basically start anew. He's just buying time at every position that he can. He uh, start, and Richard has to spend many months again at Jaffa, just rebuilding, refortifying, um, so that he can go out fresh. Um, give his men some rest, obviously, given that they've just crossed vast amounts of desert and survived um, a Muslim onslaught out there. And so at this point, he is stationed at Jaffa. And then after a, a little while, he obviously decides it's time. We need to start pressing inwards now towards towards Jerusalem. And so fortifying and um, positioning himself as he goes. He gets to a place called Beit Nuba, which is about 12 miles outside of Jerusalem. So he's really, really close to Jerusalem at this point. But then he decides to retreat. And he decides that instead he should go and take Asalon. Um, so you can see here, again, really cautious, really cautious. Like, sure, Jerusalem's the the main goal but are we ready yet are we ready and richard decides that they're not and so he goes back to to restore asalon instead yeah that's one of the things that um the 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 muslim chroniclers have said about the crusaders since day one is Mm. that they're actually quite cautious despite everything Mm. um they're actually really quite cautious and uh, uh but 
there's a there's a super super image at this point where Richard and his army are quite literally can see the the, the spires of Jerusalem in the mm. distance on the horizon. They're supposed to be able to actually see Jerusalem. It's in sight. Um, uh, but Richard sort of knows for logistical reasons, for sort of practical reasons, uh, uh, won't be able to take it, at least at, on this attempt. Um, and so sort of, it, the lion is, says that he sort of refuses to look upon it. If he can't take it, he doesn't even want to look upon it. Mm. Um, and that's, again, sort of a very romantic, um, in a particular type of romance, <laughs> a romantic image, isn't it, that, um, that he got that yeah. close? Yeah. Uh, it's romantic, isn't it? In the sense that it's just fueled by emotion. Um, you've gone all that way. You've done all of that, and then you just know that you don't have the the means. You know, you could take it, but co you couldn't hold it. Um, you're you're exhausted. Your army is exhausted, um, mm. and you just don't have. You don't, you don't have it in you. and um, But it changed very, very quickly. Um, they were really fueled by um, fervor and uh, religious conviction. And they were convinced that, you know, they were just going to be like their forefathers back in, in 1099. And, and Richard just has to break it to them and tell them, sorry, we're not. Um, yeah, gutting, gutting for them. Mm. Um, and so he goes back uh, towards the coast again, and Salah Hadin has laid siege to Jaffa again, which Richard has obviously just taken and just rebuilt. And the battle and siege of Jaffa is essentially the the last major conflict of the of the Third Crusade. So shall we mm. shall we press into it? Yeah, yeah. This, this. the obviously. Uh, Jaffa has a limited garrison that Richard has left with it. And Richard comes in to relieve the garrison and just starts doing his his thing, you know, what he's been doing for <laughs> starts being Richard, you know, <laughs> starts um going going through the, the Muslim army and at this point, uh, there's a really interesting, um, again, anecdote about him and Salah Hadin, where Richard's horse is shot out from beneath him. And Salah Hadin sees, is, is on the periphery, you know, just on the hill watching this battle. And he sees that Richard's horse has been shot out from beneath him. And he turns to his men and he says, um, how can it be that a knight, a king, fights on foot with his men? And he has two Arabian horses sent to Richard so that he can get back on the horse and fight like a king again. And Richard just graciously accepts them. Um, crazy, absolutely crazy. Um, it just goes to show that, you know, even amongst the, the slaughter and the violence, that you can, you can find light and honour even in the darkest of occasions, where men almost forget to be men, um, well, not really, not forget to be men, but where, but, but where men become animalistic, mm. they can still find that sense of honor that normally is just reserved for peacetime. It's very, I find it a very, very interesting little anecdote um, from history. Yeah, no, absolutely, it's a great one. And Saladin, um, you know, these guys are extremely brutal in one sense. You know, they'll they'll order thousands of people beheaded or something, and then mm. in another sense, they can be very very honourable. You know, and I think it's interesting all throughout war. Sometimes you get sort of that that no holds barred type war. I'm thinking of the Eastern Front, World War Two, mm. for example. Quite often, uh, no holds barred, uh, yes. no call to spared, no pity ever. Mm -hmm. And then other times, uh, I, I did a thing for Epochs um, about Operation Market Garden, the uh, uh, Bridge Too mm -hmm. Far, where after um, after the the, the 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 British paratroopers had, had given up at Arnhem, um, the German troopers were going round um, giving them cigarettes and chocolate and congratulating them on how well they fought. 
and and uh, you know exchanging little anecdotes about what what just happened and um, and shaking hands and all that sort of thing. You know, yeah, goodness. just just hours before they were they were trying to kill each other, and now they're sort of chatting as as uh, well almost as friends. Um, so yeah, it is interesting that in war, both ancient, medieval, and modern, um, mm. sometimes it is that that animalistic thing. It's a good word actually, uh, that animalistic thing where there's there's just zero zero pity. Uh, but often though, that that's that's rare. Often it's not that. Often there's some sort of camaraderie between enemies, and um, yeah, Saladin is a is a good example of uh, it. Well, that anecdote certainly is a great example of where um, yeah, he wasn't trying to exterminate them for the sake of it. You know, it wasn't like um, he he hated th their guts uh, at, at, at an animalistic level. No, it wasn't yeah. that. He had respect. He had respect for for them on on some level you know it's it's, it's fascinating it really is yeah but also as well salah Hadin has a mandate from his emirs and from his followers it's like no no you're in power to do a certain task for us which is jihad on the frankish people like that's why you're here you know you are the leader of this cause so salah Hadin, you know, it doesn't matter how much respect, you know, not that I ever think he'd like convert to Christianity. I'm not saying that, but it doesn't matter how much respect you have. You're in a position of power and you have a, a duty to your fellow Muslims to carry out what that position demands of you. And that position is kick the Crusaders back into the sea. Mm. And quite often, especially in sort of the the, the Middle Ages, uh, uh, not always, of course, far from always, but quite often, people would respect rank. Um, mm. You know, Saladin wouldn't have done that for anyone, but it, no. but because Richard is a king, sort of a, an anointed king, mm. that yeah, uh, that you, your rank demands <laughs> that you be treated, mm. or, or, or you, you know, that you have some sort of yeah, some sort of respect for it, and that. In Saladin's mind, at least, uh, it was sort of unbecoming that Richard had no mount. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, and, uh, you can only imagine that Saladin would have hoped for something similar in return if the, if the tables had been turned, and if anyone would have probably done it, Richard would have. Richard was one of those people, like I say, after the civil wars with his father, he pardoned nearly everyone that fought against him. Hmm. So Richard definitely had that in his character as well, this respect for rank. Um, so, yeah, yeah it, it does but, seem I mean, a bit uh, naive almost to the modern age because we don't really have a great deal of that anymore. Um, no. But, but there you go. That's the way it was. Yeah. I mean, he even forgave the uh, the Frenchman who shot him, you know, and, and killed him. He pardoned him. That's right. Yeah. Was, yeah. yeah. You know, so uh, but back to the uh, the crusade. So um, Richard once again manages to lift the sh uh, lift the siege, and at that point, it's become very clear to both sides that they're just spent. That there's nowhere else for them to go. Um, Richard has managed to pull the crusaders back from the brink of nothing and managed to secure, you know. Tyre, Acre, Jaffa, you know, he's managed to create a new, uh, almost restore the Crusader states to their former size, but he, he did fail to take Jerusalem. Um, and likewise, you know, Salah Hadin um, is, at this point, has his own matters to attend to as well, because he's, uh, he, he's dying. He's, you know, he, I mean, he only lives about six more months um after richard uh leaves uh which again one of those massive what ifs um but so essentially the two of them agreed to the treaty of jaffa um in which it's agreed that the uh christians will be allowed to pilgrim uh, to have pilgrimages to jerusalem uh and will be peacefully protected and allowed to visit the holy city and obviously, in return, there is to be a peace between the Muslims and the Crusaders uh, for the time being. Um, and so what, one more thing before we get to 
uh, Richard fleeing is that he obviously has to put all of his all the affairs in order before he goes back because Richard's obviously desperate to get back because he's learned that Philip II is taking his lands and that his own brother John has betrayed him and is working with Philip and so he has to go home or he's not going to have a home to come back to uh, that will welcome him uh, he'll be an outsider from his own kingdom so but there is just the matter of uh, what to do about Guy de Lusignan and uh, Conrad and Montferrat. That that um, that little debate f right back from the beginning about who was going to be king of Jerusalem. Well, they haven't taken it, um, but Richard gives sells Cyprus to the Templars, and he makes Guy de Lusignan. Uh, Lord of Cyprus, and Guy has a dynasty there that lasts until the 1500s, until the Ottomans eventually take it, which is, you know, I, I'd say Guy got a pretty good deal there, <laughs> yeah. given all of his failure <laughs> up yeah. till that point. It's, it's failing upwards in my books. <laughs> um, and as for Conrad, he was begrudgingly, Richard did begrudgingly in the end, award him the uh, title of uh, king, but um, Conrad is assassinated by the assassins, um, the Ismaili assassins, um, one of the most famous assassinations uh, by the assassin order in during the time of the Crusades. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, they were a religious sect of Ismailis. Um, which means that uh, who came from the Fatimid Empire. And essentially what the assassins believed was that they were Muslims, but they were of the Ismaili sect and believed that nothing is outside of God. Um, but if there is also evil in the world, then God must be, God can't be all loving, surely. If everything is within God, then God is both good and evil at once. Um, which is obviously heretical to most Muslim sensibilities. Um, but yeah, so they're their own religious sect. And uh, they have Conrad assassinated. What is uh, dubious is there was a lot of talk at the time over whether or not Richard had asked them to do the assassination. Um for my own part, I don't think he would have done. And I don't see what was in it for the assassins to do it on his behalf. Um, but I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on it. Yeah, no, my take is exactly that. How is how is that in Richard's interest? Any, yeah. How is any of that in his interest? Yeah. Um, the um, Again, like where I comically pronounce Saladin, Salahuddin, again, the assassins, <laughs> like it's Ashashin, like, or something like mm. that, you know. <laughs> yeah. Mm. What is it? The old man in the mountain or the old man on the mountain, the league of the assassins. Yeah, so, um, yeah, they're fascinating. Yeah, they're a fascinating uh, sect is probably not the right word, but a mm. fascinating um, group of people. Yeah. And how they um, obviously the word assassin has come down to us in English to mean, yes. you know, well, we all know what, what the connotations of what it means. But no, mm. I don't I don't think Richard was behind that. I have heard that. Um, but it just doesn't really make much sense. I mean, you can you can sort of argue it that he just wanted him out of the way that he was more of a, a pain in the neck than anything else. Um, mm. But yeah, I don't I don't I don't buy that. I don't see that. Um, there was one one little um, moment, one little scene, one little anecdote. I, I just wanted to mention before we sort of start uh, rounding this off, closing it off, is that just again to uh, underscore how much of a, a badass Richard really was. Um, yeah. I think it was, I think it was in the relief of Jaffa, but I can't remember at some point, at some point he leads, he gets in a boat and there's like him and literally, I think a handful of knights, like three or four or five knights with him. And he mm. rows out to, I think it must be in the relief of Jaffa. Um, just those, just those guys, him and like five knights or something against an entire city um absolutely insane and they the 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 muslims saladin's army believe oh well this must be the vanguard 
of a much, much bigger attack. Because who would do that? What an insane yeah. suicidal thing. Nobody, nobody in their right mind would be doing that unless it's just the 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 the, the spear tip, the vanguard of a much bigger attack. And it wasn't. It wasn't. It was just Richard <laughs> just absolutely confident in his own ability. You know, one yeah. when you're plated up, he's sort of like a tank, you know, that's sort of the obvious yeah. analogy. But like yeah. he'll take on, I'm I'm gonna try and storm the walls, I'm gonna try and take on a whole army effectively almost on my own. And um, yeah, and it worked. They lost confidence. Like, um, it, you know, he wasn't cut down. He wasn't just overwhelmed and killed. I mean, yeah, it, it's it speaks of almost almost an, to up to our minds and a modern mind to a normal person like you or I. Um, it's almost insane, right? It's almost like um, like you, you you just can't quite believe it. It's like it's like something out of a comedy sketch. Um, and mm. yet, some of these people, some of these knights, people like Richard, um, were like just absolutely convinced of their own martial ability and um uh, well mm. I, they just don't we don't see men like that much anymore where you're prepared to um no. you're prepared to throw the dice high you're prepared to just risk your life on an incredible long shot and um and like we say yeah. he had that Midas touch it, of course it, it it failed him in the end and he was killed relatively ignominiously like as you mentioned the, the guy that he mm. ended up pardoning um but yeah, until until his luck left him, he uh, he was sort of he, he had that touch, and it's sort of again, it's sort of it's hard to argue. It's not one of the high watermarks of of chivalry, of sort of uh, uh, knightly martial prowess. It's just great. It's it's like something out of a a boy's own story. It's it's just it's just great stuff. Love it. He absolutely deserves his epithet mm. of lion heart. It's there's no mm. question about it. it mm. It's. It's a level of courage um, and bravery that I I struggle to find parallel in at any mm. point in history. As you say, you know, it's like, oh, is is that an army attacking us? No, it's the King of England. It's like, you know, any, you know, it's um, it's incredible in a way. Uh, having said that, you know, it's that important thing about Richard that he, you know, a, a lot of people say of him oh, well, he was an amazing warrior, but he was a terrible king, you know, because he didn't really care about England and he was prepared to bleed its economy dry to, to fund his crusade. Um, I, I think it's a little... I think it's slightly dishonest. Uh, not that Richard didn't have any of... Not that the charges are particularly untrue, but... Are we, re are we are we saying that England at that time didn't expect Richard to do his duty as king and go on that crusade? I can't see how the English people didn't also back his mandate to go and do what he did. Um, certainly in comparison to John, I think they'd rather have had Richard over John any day. Yeah, no, definitely. That again, that angle is really, I think, sort of rank revisionism. Um, Churchill and Omar both say that um, no, even in his day, Richard was beloved by the English. <laughs> mm. Yeah, they were used to um, the Plantagenet or Norman kings that might spend very little time in England. They were used to that sort yeah. of thing. They hated John so much more. I mean, John is a a real uh piece of work uh you know it's not an exaggeration right. um it's very very and very he's... difficult to like um mm. and uh, when richard came back from the crusades he came back to england um briefly not for too long and he put things mm. in order in england before going off to the continent or start fighting again um mm. and everything was done by the law everything was done correctly um uh, he was, it seems, at the time and in all the centuries since, until recently, was sort of roundly loved by the English people. Um, mm. So this narrative that um, oh, he would, he just wanted to bleed England of all its money. I mean, yes, that's sort of true. Yeah, <laughs> there are quotes yeah. where he said, you know, I would sell London if I could find the right price. Yeah, but right, but but that that's not out of character for the kings of those days to have that sort of opinion, and he wasn't hated for it. He wasn't hated for it. He was, if you went on crusade, <clears throat> you were loved. It's as simple as that. You've done well, the God's work. the highest good. 
mm, that mm, a person exactly. at the time can possibly go and achieve. Exactly. You know, what did Richard spend his money on versus what did John spend his money on? Oh, Richard was never in England. Well, John was in England all the time and wouldn't leave it alone. And that was to his detriment. You know, right. <laughs> yeah. I, I bet the English people wish that John would go on crusade, mm. <laughs> you know, just leave them alone. Um, when Richard so, yeah. came back and John sort of fled within England, um, he found it very, very hard to find any friends. And Richard came back and was sort of immediately, uh, you know, lauded as, as uh, you know, the legit king. There's no question about any of that. And um, no, it's a, it's a strange narrative, really, I find that that he was he, he was a war criminal. He was hated. Uh, he hated England. He was gay. You know that one. Have you heard that narrative? He he actually slept with Philip Augustus and was gay. It's like it's just well, that, that, it, that, It's not true. That is actually alluded to in the light uh, line in winter, is it not? Yeah, yeah. Or well, they sort of say it in that. Yeah. So where that comes from is that there used to be all sorts of uh, to us, to our modern mind, sort of strange things that uh, powerful men would do to show that they were now formally politically friends, that they'd made an alliance with each other. For example, one of the strange ones that I think uh, Baldwin of Edessa did is that you'd, you'd get a really big, giant, oversized shirt and the two men would put one shirt on. So they were sort of chest to chest. Right. You put this big shirt over you, right? That was yeah. a, a symbol that you were now politically friends, right? Mm. Now, it, to our mind, that's just weird, right? That's just, why would you do that? That's odd, but okay, whatever. Sure. It's, it's the 11th century. Okay, one of the things that was done was that you would sleep in the same bed for a night. Two men mm. would sleep in the same bed for the night. A big, a big royal bed. There's nothing mm. sexual about it whatsoever. Anyway, Richard and Philip did that one time. Now, mm. people have used that to say, ah, they're gay, you see. There's a homosexual element to that. Well, there's no, there's no... There's no evidence whatsoever of any of that, hmm. and yet it's sort of salacious, isn't it? It's sort of, uh, it's sort of, uh, it's a, it's an an interesting angle, but it's just not true. But people, again, they realise that the 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 English or the uh, the English speaking peoples revere Richard. So let's make him a war criminal. Let's make him gay. Let's make him hated. Let's make him sort of anti English. All these sorts of things. It's all it's all just nonsense. It's all just to sort of undermine our sort of national our national stories really and so um yeah it's just yeah. it's just not true but um i really like Richard and i heart he's one of my top five yeah i do too favorite yeah things. yeah definitely i mean he it's that thing isn't it he did what was required of him at the time mm. he was given you mm. know mm. Uh, yeah no uh, really really and just uh, as you know I, I hope has come across to some of the people listening um, to this, just what a what a story, what a life, you know, just the, the legend of of what he did and and what he encountered and yeah, no, just amazing, truly. Mm. Yeah, no, I agree. So third crusade over, I suppose. All right. Well, it's been uh, just knocking three hours, so. Um... It's been great. I think maybe if we speak next time, why don't we do the second crusade? Because we totally skipped over the second crusade, didn't we? We did. <laughs> so maybe yeah. we could do the second or maybe even the fourth crusade, because I actually, despite everything, the fourth crusade is like a, a damp squib in a way. Um, it's much less um, fantastic. But I think it's absolutely as pivotal, if not more pivotal than the others in, in different ways. It's a whole story. So yeah. um, maybe we, from when we talk again, uh, maybe we could do the second and or fourth crusade, something like that. But uh, I think you've done uh, really well on the third crusade there. It's just unfortunate. We got slightly miscommunication where I thought we were doing the first and you thought we were doing the third. But we've right. covered both the bases now. So um, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Best of both. Uh, well, no, so, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Ben. No, thank you for your time, Luca. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, I'll let you get on with the rest of your day. Uh, but yeah, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.